I'm still very bullish for 2024, but I do think it's going to be very different to the rally we saw last year. The broader theme we're seeing right now is there's some structural changes in the market. I actually think it's the economic downturn that's the biggest risk that's not priced into markets. The markets are now back to this good news on the economic front which is causing yields to back up, being sort of bad news on the equity front. There are times to be concerned about the outlook. Right now is not one of those times. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly positive. What a ridiculous afternoon yesterday was. Let's bring up Bitcoin. <laughs> it's happened, Tom. The SEC says the spot ETF has been approved and then drum roll 15 minutes later. It's a hoax. Katie Greifeld was a saint yesterday. I was on with her on radio and I reamed her about Gary Gensler and how upset the chairman of the SEC is over this entire Bitcoin folly we're going through. And then what, John? Three hours later, all hell breaks loose at the SEC. So this is what we've heard from X. Twitter, the breach was not due to any issues with its systems, adding the account didn't have two-factor authentication enabled at the time of the incident. This is pretty embarrassing stuff, Tom for the SEC on a big issue that a lot of people in this market have been waiting to see the result of. Let's be clear, it is a big issue. And you see this, folks, with the number of people. I think Greifeld says we're up way over 20 uh, ETFs coming in here that will buy Bitcoin. And also the desperation to get out front on this. There's a fee war going on. John, ages ago, we had gas wars where it would be like 29 cents a gallon. And there'd be a gas war and get it down to four cents a gallon. Sure. That's where Bitcoin is right now. Bitcoin just about unchanged this morning in and around 46K. We need to talk about a better mood. This from Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro on this program yesterday and publishing it shortly thereafter, Tom. Rest in peace vibe session. Consumer expectations are climbing as inflation is cooling. Small business sentiment hitting a five-month high. Is confidence starting to pick up to start a new year? Well, it's there and you can see it in the data on the screen. We're going to do a data check here in a moment. John does it better than me. 12.83 on the VIX is all you got to know about a buoyancy in the market. Again, we see it today with the NASDAQ uh, green. I mean, the drawdown on this crushing difficult January we're having on the Dow Jones Industrial Average is half a percent. I know. It's a pullback. I know. I know. No drama. Let's get to the scores on the S&P 500, just about positive on the S&P. We are up by 0.1%. Yields are coming in a couple of basis nice, points. 398.86 on a US 10-year. The euro, a little bit snoozy once again. 109.50. Yeah. That currency pair positive by 0.16%. Tons to look out for through the day. Let's get to the brief this morning. The Fed speak TK. John Williams, 3.15 yeah. Eastern time. We've got Mester <clears throat> We've got McKee sitting down with her. You've got Kashkari coming up a little bit later in the in, week. In the last 24 hours, Howard Marks' annual letter in Kenneth Rogoff out front of your Davos, John, with a blistering Project Syndicate essay that rates are going to stay higher. Well, John Williams discussed that. John Williams says rates are going to come back down to some form of where we were before covid and people like the investor Howard Marks, the academic Kenneth Rogoff say, you're wrong. The week really begins this afternoon <clears throat> with that speech from the New York Fed President John Williams. And then it's about the data tomorrow morning. CPI, <clears throat> 8.30 Eastern time, onto PPI on Friday. TK, I know you've had this circled on the calendar for the last month. It is. The dynamics of this is going to be interesting. I'm going to go to the land of Rosenberg, which is he slices and dices it up and looks for a trend. And I guess you got to go back to the tried and true, John, which is what is the vector on service sector disinflation. There's been some good news there. Will we continue to see that? Or is it going to be all about goods deflation and the imputed disinflation and deflation we're seeing out of a weak China? And once we get through the numbers, TK, we're going to be talking about the earnings, the big banks on deck. This Friday, you're going to hear from JP Morgan, <coughs> from Citigroup, from Bank of America, from Wells Fargo, all reporting, Tom, to close out the week and take you into the weekend. This is a huge deal. On radio, you see in one year, JP Morgan up 23%. That's not what banks are supposed to do. <laughs> and John, it's, it's real simple here. The zeitgeist and Gina Martin-Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence, among those leading on this is, you know what? 
It's a pretty grim view out there. Ben Laidler, I thought yesterday was great on this when he wasn't vamping on BitDog. And the, be- the bottom line is there's some worthy people saying this could be better than good. Let's get the conversation started this morning. Good morning to you all. We can do that with Russ Kostrick, Global Allocation Fund Portfolio Manager over at BlackRock. Russ, good morning to you, sir. It's great to catch up. I know you went overweight stocks last year. Let's talk about what you're doing just around sectors, pairing back some of the exposure to big cap tech, mega cap tech. Russ, why is that? Good morning, Jonathan. You know, we still think the market can move higher in 2024. Uh, We do think it's going to be a little bit of a different year from last year, which was characterized by an enormous gain and a very narrow market. So this year, probably more muted games, games, but a broader rally. So we're thinking about what are the parts of the market are cheap, which were left behind in 2023. That includes areas like energy some of the industrials, some of the healthcare. So it's not as if that the long-term themes around big tech have gone away. They haven't. We still think there's a sector you want to be overweight, but maybe use some of the overweight that you had last year to fund opportunities in some of those value areas that are really looking cheap in a market that most people view Mm -hmm. is rather expensive. Russ, what's the overall animal spirit, the underlying nominal GDP that's going to drive this economy forward? I think it's about four, four and a half percent, which is an important number because, you know, one of the things that happened last year that buoyed the market was that earnings held up and they held up because nominal GDP held up. If you think about the year we're looking at in 2024, let's call it two percent growth. Maybe inflation normalizes back to two and a half percent. That's four and a half percent nominal GDP. Well, that's a year where you probably can hit or maybe even exceed the 10 or 11 percent earnings growth that's baked into the market. So I think. When you ask why is the market going to go higher after such a spectacular 23, I think that's the main reason. Russ, what are you seeing with cash right now? Do we wait to see the money market fund trillions move or is it happening right now? You know, I think it's starting to happen, but, you know, it, it, it is such a it's a trickle and it's something that's going to take time. You know, people, you know, Tom, as you know, for the first time in 15 years, we're able to sit out in cash, get a decent return. Today, not only is it a decent nominal return, it's a decent real return. So when I speak to advisors, when I speak to clients, that money is coming out very, very slowly. But as we get into the middle of the year, as we start to see the Fed begin to lower rates, I do think you're going to see more flows into spreads, into equities, into assets that are going to maintain that yield in an environment where rates eventually are going to start to come down. Russ, I didn't hear go into bonds. You're still underweight bonds. Russ, why is that? Well, well, we are, but it really depends on where we're talking about. So we are a little bit underweight duration relative to our benchmark. Most of that is on the long end of the U.S. Treasury curve, and that has more to do with the supply of treasuries when you've got structural 7% deficits versus GDP, you've got two to two and a half trillion dollars that needs to be funded every year. What we worry about there is what is the right term premium? What is the right premium you should get for going out on the curve? However, we look at other parts of the bond market, investment grade, high yield, securitized, EM, we actually see that the nominal yield you're getting is pretty attractive. So we look at those parts of the bond market, we're actually overweight relative to our benchmark. Just to sit on the underweight a little bit more on treasuries, Russ, are you saying that the debate that's taking place in Washington, D.C., the spending deadlines of this month and early next month are already shaping your approach to the treasury market? You know, I'd say it's it's less about the 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 technical question about whether or not you're going to get a resolution on the on the near term funding. It's more about this longer term issue. I mean, think about what happened at the end of last year. We were starting to focus on things like the Treasury's quarterly refunding announcement. The market was moving on whether or not an auction went well. It had been a long time since we've seen those type of events really dramatically move the bond market. And for the first time in a long time, particularly back in August, September and October, there was a very big debate about what is the right premium you need to own long term treasuries in an environment where supply is structurally high. What's the real yield going to do here? The sh- most shocking thing I've heard into this new year, and d- uh, Russ, we're done, by the way, saying Happy New Year. We're deep into, <laughs> right. we're deep into 2020. Let's we'll skip that part. It was Priya Misra over at J.P. Morgan modeling out the collapse of the 10-year real yield. A lot of people are pushing against her on that. She's down to 1.00-ish percent. What happens to the Russ Kosterich world? if we're delivered a 1.1% 
10-year inflation-adjusted yield? Well, I think if you got down to that level, and clearly we're not there yet, and we were a long ways away from it, you know, three, three or four months ago, uh, you know, you, you'd want to be more constructive on bonds. I guess my question is, first of all, we talk about that real yield. What part of the curve are we talking about? We're talking about the short end, the belly, or the long end? I think in our discussions, a lot of that debate is around the long end and, again, about that interaction between what is the right term premium you're going to need in the environment characterized by the supply we know we're going to get in the coming years. I, I, I mean, I look, Russ, at it, it, bond, what bonds are saying about inflation and all in the heart. You know, the nominal GDP call you had a 4 4 4.5% there, and it just simply implies a continued disinflation. So then circle back to the 10-year yield and frame it around 4%. What will that dynamic look like over the year? You know, I think that's probably about right. And if we think about where the 10-year is going to trade, you know, we ended at 387. You know, I don't think it's crazy that we're going to end 2024 in that zip code. And again, that's not a bad environment. It doesn't necessarily mean that you want to back up the truck on the long end of the curve. But if you broaden that out and you think about what environment are we going to have for risky assets, we have an environment where we, we stick to soft landing and you get that four and a half, four percent nominal GDP rate volatility is coming down. The Fed is lowering rates, you know, maybe modestly on the front end of the curve. That's not a bad environment to own risk, you know, as we get into the year. Hey, Russ, great to hear from you, sir. As always, Russ Kostrick there at BlackRock. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. 387, 388. If you'd made this kind of call in the middle of October with a 10-year yield through 5%, Five, yeah. and Tom, a two-year at 525, I'm not sure how many people well, would have believed it. The gyrations, the movement, the emotions here on January 10. I think are tangible for both the bulls and, and the bears as well. And I would just, my answer is to extend out the timeline. Okay, so let's go through that exercise. Where are we March 31 when we get the Pharaoh outlook for 2024? <laughs> Where are we on the 4th of July when we celebrate the colony's uh, victory over the mother country? Mm. And, and the answer is we don't have a clue. We have no clue. No clue whatsoever. We're guessing. Well, let's talk about what's priced, the dream of a soft landing and the potential of a lose-lose situation. So this came from Deutsche Bank yesterday from Henry Allen posing this question. I think it's an important one. Raising this one, TK. With markets now pricing at a fairly rapid pace of cuts, that risk creating a lose-lose situation based on historical precedent. It probably requires a recession to get these rate cuts. Bad for risk assets. But if the economy outperforms, then markets risk being disappointed by a more hawkish outcome. Are we in truly a lose-lose situation after what we've priced I, a, over the last couple of months? You, you miss Bramo. I mean, she's off curating a ski slope right now. The answer is uh, I'm not going to do lose-lose, win-win, good news, bad news, and that. What I'd suggest is there's just a huge amount of mystery in my comfort, whether I'm right or wrong, is to center back a la Michael Darda or Gina Martin-Adams to, okay, what's nominal GDP to underpin revenue growth? to get down the income statement. And as Russ Koster had said there, four to four and a half percent is, it's not boom, it's not COVID, but that's a pretty darn good number. This is what Neil Dutton from Nason's Macro said on this program yesterday, yeah. Tom, the real GDP of two, two and a half through the year ahead, a Federal Reserve delivering some surgical rate cuts, and you can be in a decent position. Things are going to be okay. All this macro stuff is always great, just as a thought exercise. But at the moment, for the likes of Neil, he just sees a continuation yeah. of the trend. Things are going to be okay. First time I've mentioned this, guess what's going to happen? What's that? The banks are going to underplay their profitability on Friday. We've got to talk about even, BlackRock. Even if there's some challenge, we've got to talk, got about, to talk Black about BlackRock. BlackRock. Real challenges there. I mean, John and Lisa are getting ready to curate Davos. Is that your and word he, of the day? That's my word of the day. Curate. curate. Curation. Yeah, Lisa told me that. I got it from Lisa. Like the curator that works at the museum. You know, you're curating the interviews, the mm. conversations and all that. It's great. I, I'm home. Vet Bill's got the flu. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. Larry Fink is such a presence at the meetings of the World Economic yeah. Forum. It's going to be interesting to see how they handle the dynamics of ESG, which is really taken to heart over the last year. Job cuts. More job cuts announced at BlackRock. We'll talk about them a little bit later in the program. We're going to catch up with Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management a little bit later this morning in the next hour at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. From New York City this morning, equity futures just about positive. Good morning. Twenty-four nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. 
Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. He was not informed until last Friday that Secretary Austin was in the hospital. He was not informed until this morning that the root cause of that hospitalization was prostate cancer. We all recognize that this didn't unfold the way it should have on so many levels, not just the notification process up the chain of command, but the transparency issue. We all recognize that. And I think we all want to make sure we learn from that. Just absolutely stunning the last couple of days in Washington. That was National Security Council spokesman John Kirby addressing Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's sudden disappearance and hospitalization, now learning that it was due to complications from surgery, Tom, for prostate cancer. Suddenly, it's serious. And then, you know, we don't need to do Dr. John here, but the bottom line is now we know it's serious. It always is serious. And I would suggest the tone changed with that announcement yesterday. I, I just think... There was a mystery of like, what's he in for? This, this, this. Sure. And jokes were made, including me. And guess what? Now we know and it's serious and they're going to have to gracefully figure out what to do. Kirby didn't even try and dress it up. I think it was pretty direct. Yeah. I'm not sure how you yeah. dress yeah. anything that's up, any of this up. Anyway, Tom, still plenty of questions as to how this happens. Oh, yeah. yeah plenty of questions. The, and, and again, it's the overlay, John, which you and I have personally witnessed in Washington of the Biden administration, whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, doesn't matter. It's what is the character and tone of communication within any administration? I mean, some administrations, there's a cacophony of the Trump process. There's others where it's all from 1600, this massive delegation. Reagan was notorious for delegating and, you know. You just get the feeling, Tom, we talked about this yesterday. The approach and the attitude of this administration appears to be, we're the adults in the room, trust us. We're not going to talk to you, though. But just trust us, we're the adults in the room, we can take care of this. Didn't feel very adult in the last week, did yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is uh, there's that whole trust us attitude and it drives people nuts of all political persuasions in at Washington. We're going to get a brief now, and this is really special. Because in Nashua, New Hampshire, there is Ward 1, 2 through Ward 9. There's a Dr. Norman Chris Elementary School, 50 Arlington Street. Matthew Bartlett knows each and every ward in Nashua, New Hampshire. Oh he is gosh, hardcore wow. New Hampshire and joins us this morning. Darby Field Advisors, a Republican strategist with service in the Trump administration until a certain January date. I got to go there first, Matthew, as you joined surveillance for the first time. What was it like on January 6th when you said, see ya? Yeah, um, you know, thanks, Tom. Listen, it was a very, very hard day here in this town in Washington. And I remember walking home. It was during COVID um, and, and crossing the Capitol and just seeing the utter mayhem and feeling utter disgust. Um, and made what was just the easiest decision I've ever made in my career, which was, dear Mr. Secretary, I hereby resign immediately from the State Department. Decisions um, will be so made yeah, in, kind of a, excuse me, decisions will be made in New Hampshire, Matthew Bartlett. What's the tone you see right now among Republicans? Well, exactly. It's January and, you know, the business community, the, the country is looking at a lot of those, those uh, snow-covered roads. Um, right now it's not Davos, it might be Davenport. Uh, Iowa it might be Dover, New Hampshire. And, um, you know, we are looking at what is either the beginning or maybe the end. Uh, President Trump has a significant lead. There are really two battlegrounds right now. It's Iowa, which he may have locked up, and it's a question of expect expectations. And then it's over to New Hampshire, the Granite State, my home state, um, where Nikki Haley may be putting together um, some puzzle pieces um, with her granite heels on, climbing the mountain, and, and may, shock, uh, may shock the Trump campaign, may shock the world. And if so, then we have a race. Um, but if President Trump um, really blows it out in both states, I think this nomination might be wrapped up and wrapped up pretty quickly. Well, Matthew, let's talk about that. You've been on the ground with every candidate, I believe, in the field. Matthew, do you see anything on the ground that's difficult to reconcile with what we all see in the polls? Oh, sure. Right now, polls, um, you'll, you'll see a lot of um, national polls. 
Those poll polls are certainly um, you know, lagging indicators. It is the state polls that are the leading indicators. The nomination process is not a, you know, as we know, a national election. It's a state by state um, event. And right now in Iowa and in New Hampshire, the race is not nationalized, rather it's personalized. Um, people get to go and meet the candidates up front, hear from them directly, unfiltered, um, from, you know, uh, free from, from media, free from ads, um, get to ask questions. And that's really where, pe where people can, can, um, um, can make their stake. And I think that's what we see Nikki Haley do to a, to a very high degree. What's the number one issue that you think is attracting voters to the likes of Nikki Haley? Um, I, you know, I think it's probably a mixture of policies of, you know, maybe the Biden administration, um, whether it's foreign policy, domestic spending, inflation um, that have kind of pushed people um, away from, you know, their vote, in maybe 2020 or away from the Democratic Party. Um, but more importantly, uh, looking back towards uh, what people see as, you know, a, a firmer Republican Party that maybe is absent some of the mayhem, some of the personality deficits uh, that former President Trump um, has displayed for the better part of a decade now. Matthew Barlow, Terry Haynes visits often from Pangea, and he, he made a comment a number of months ago where he said there's a complete misjudgment about the number of GOP who really aren't in love with the former president. In Politico, Jonathan Martin, the headline, where are all the anti-Trump Republicans? Where are they, Matthew, and are there any in Concord, New Hampshire? Oh, certainly. Um, you know, if you look at New Hampshire, it is uh, the only purple state, maybe the only swing state, in addition to being an early state. Uh, Republicans can only vote in the Republican primary. Democrats can only vote in the Democratic primary. <laughs> but independents, of which there are more than um, uh, Republicans or Democrats, can vote in either one. So right now, the, the independents of New Hampshire, um, mm -hmm. those that actually decide the general election, are going to have a significant role in choosing the Republican nominee, or at least impacting that. Um, right now, it looks as if they're going to Nikki Haley. There is a Trump fatigue factor. In fact, when you go to her um, town halls, one of the biggest applause lines you hear, she's quite candid. She says, listen, polling says Donald Trump might be up uh, one to four points on, right. on Joe Biden, but I'm up 17 points. So I think a lot of strong conservatives look at that as a resounding, um, you know, rationale for her uh, candidacy, and a lot of independent voters, uh, you know, find her to be the Goldilocks candidate. What, right what now. does President Biden need to do to garner those GOP disaffected votes? Does he need to communicate with them, like is communicating with the Pentagon? <laughs> Yeah, I think communication's a, a good start. Um, you know, putting priority that you see, you hear, you listen to those, uh, that, that it is a warm place. Maybe some of his policies have been rather progressive. He's been, um, for the past four years, uh, really um, attuned to the, to the left wing of his party. Now, as we turn a corner into a potential, you know, general election, he really needs to make sure that that coalition that he built in 2020 stays with him, that they do not feel deflated. And that's from the left on, on, on certain issues, which may be a little more sensitive. Maybe it's foreign policy issues, as we're seeing in, play out in, in, in Michigan. Um, but, but again, those disaffected voters who thought Trump, you know, maybe they liked his policy, but they just thought his personality was just too much. Now it's, a t uh, it's gonna be yet again a choosing time, um, potentially between Trump and Biden, and, and, and who can swing those voters right back. Let's get to TV programming later on this evening. Just to wrap things up, Matthew, 9 p.m. Eastern time, I believe, you've got Ron versus Nikki on CNN. And then you've got the former president, kind of programming on Fox News. What's the approach from Nikki and Ron gonna be? Are they going after each other or going after the former president? I, I mean, listen, it's gonna be both. Um, you know, more than anything right now, the Republican Party wants somebody with attitude and swagger. And that is certainly why Donald Trump has had a command over the party, um, not just uh, over the past few months, but over the past few years. Um, so it is a performance. It is how you take a punch, how you land a punch, how you come back from a punch. Uh, Nikki Haley has really made her bones in this race by lighting up Vivek Ramaswamy like a pinball machine at debates. Um, and it seems that voters appreciate that. Look for more of that tonight. Let's continue the conversation through this month. Matthew, great to catch up. Matthew Bartlett there of Derby Field Advisors. TK on the TV programming later this evening. Be interesting to see DeSantis will be fascinating how he approaches the next two weeks. How they approach each other yeah. and the former president. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Equity Futures, just about unchanged.
Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here are the scores on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq will take a look at small caps as well. On the S&P, we're just about unchanged. A muted marginal move lower in yesterday's session. On the Nasdaq, doing OK. Tech actually was OK in yesterday's session as well. This morning, the Nasdaq is up by 0.2%. Tom on the Nasdaq 100. There's one thing out there, John, on the data that we haven't talked about, and it's off the radar. It should be off the radar. It's idiosyncratic. But nevertheless, we're going to have a milestone and a measured path to 30 Turkish lira per dollar. We are in the land of the great Steve Hankey of Johns Hopkins University. And the answer is the continued depreciation, devaluation. I'm going to say it's an idiosyncratic story until it's not. But 29.xx Turkish lira is something to watch as we go into uh, Friday's earnings. As that's on the radar in the yeah. FX market. I'll get you a roundup of foreign exchange in just a moment. Let's turn to the bond market, the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year. The two-year, really, really small moves in either direction over the last three days or so. We're down a couple of basis points this morning to 4.34.13. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about how really the week begins this afternoon when you hear from the New York Fed President John Williams. Then tomorrow morning, CPI data, Friday morning, PPI data, all of that still to come. The 10-year has just been in and around 4% for the last few sessions, 399.43 <clears throat> on a 10-year. We're down a couple of basis points. In foreign exchange, Tom, you mentioned dollar lira. Let's talk about euro dollar. The euro really quite stable, 109.50, 109.45. by 0.1%. Well, seriously, when was the last time it moved? Like four months ago? We haven't had a big move. Yeah. for a while. Maybe that's in a foreign successful exchange. Lagarde. Maybe she can Things are settling that. down. Yeah. We'll hear from the ECB president next week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Let's get you the top stories this morning. Under surveillance, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun admitting the company's mistake as it deals with the fallout from a fuselage panel blowing out during a recent Alaska Airlines flight. Calhoun speaking during a company-wide meeting at its 737 factory near Seattle. All I could think about, I didn't know what happened to whoever was supposed to be in the seat next to that hole in the airplane. I got kids, I got grandkids, and so do you. This stuff matters. This stuff really matters. The FAA saying Boeing's instructions for checking planes were insufficient and the company will revise them. Tom, every time we go over this story, the more you get fresh details, new reporting, every single hour, every single day, the near miss that took place here. I'm going to take, what could have been yeah. is absolutely shocking. Oh, yeah. There's no question about that. And it harkens back Qantas, I think, in Australia had some equivalencies. And there's been others, Hawaiian Air, uh, years ago. What I'm going to do is listen to adults, and the adult in the room for Bloomberg Surveillance is Brooke Sutherland. She was lights out yesterday about the restructuring that needs to be done in this nation institutionally to get airline economics, airline safety on the same page. I'm going to listen to Brooke Sutherland. Brooke mentioned the culture of this company as yeah. well, Tom, whether something was rotten at the heart of Boeing. It's not for me to suggest that. That's a question people are asking, though. We'll catch up with Jeffries, I think, later this hour. Perhaps that's going to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. going forward from here. Just what is going on internally, Tom, yeah. at Boeing? My, I, my, my bias is to my ute, and the answer is the day they moved out of Seattle, the company was changed. I'm sure Mr. Calhoun would push against that. Let's move to this story, TK. The latest in Washington, D.C. Doctors <coughs> revealing Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been hospitalized over complications from prostate cancer surgery. The update coming in response to frustration about the Defense Secretary's absence. The White House admitting it didn't fully know about the diagnosis until yesterday. Tom, I think we've already said this in the last 24 hours, but given we know what it is now, we hope that he has a speedy recovery. One. Two. Personal issues aside, Clearly, there are protocols, Tom, that were just not followed here in this administration. You know, you got a guy out of West Point. Let's be sure this guy's tough as nails at West Point where there's a few thugs on the field. This guy played rugby. So, you know, this is somebody who's right from the start at West Point has been tough as nails and, and that's his reputation and such. But you got to just say to yourself, OK, we got to get through this gracefully. What's the next step? And of course, many people are suggesting with his illness, he should find a constructive and graceful way to resign. There was nothing graceful about yesterday afternoon with the SEC saying its X account was compromised after sharing an incorrect post that the regulator had approved spot Bitcoin ETFs. SEC Chair Gary Gensler stepping in minutes later on a social media platform writing, quote, the SEC account was compromised 
an unauthorized tweet was posted. X is saying the breach was not due to any issues with its systems, adding the account did not have two-factor authentication enabled at the time of the incident. Um, Tom, this is just embarrassing all round. It's, you use the word graceful. There's nothing graceful about any of this yesterday afternoon. It's been really, really difficult. And what I find unfortunate within this debate, and let's be honest, there's a collegial debate about Bitcoin, say, within a retirement plan and, and all that. Uh, I'm going to go back to January 8th, far more important than a busted tweet at the SEC and the embarrassment. It's a thread. That's where they do a sequence of tweets. John, I'm just going to read here. I'll sure. take the middle thread. I'm just picking randomly. Investments in crypto assets also can be exceptionally risky and are often volatile. A number of major platforms and crypto assets have become insolvent, et cetera, et cetera. That's from the financial advisor, G. Gensler and Sons. So we're still waiting for a decision. Still waiting for a decision, and maybe it comes later on today. I, I no idea. Never, never have I seen a chairman so seemingly against pending legislation. Never seen it. Let's go to the economy right now. We're doing this with this important CPI report. I'd like to dive into that because all these other stories have been a distraction. Rabila Faruqi joins us now, chief U.S. inflation economist at High Frequency Economics. Your colleague in crime, Carl Weinberg, yesterday out with a blistering note on EU inflation of 1.9 percent. Rabila, are we going to have the same conversation in America? Are we heading for sub-2% inflation in the U.S.? Good morning. Great to be with you. Uh, we are looking at a pattern of inflation, a direction that is going to show pretty substantial deceleration from this point on. We've already seen you know, a substantial move, and we think that the dynamics of the labor market, supply, demand, and uh, you know, the demand side of this economy – uh, you know, su supply side issues have mostly been resolved, you know, barring any geopolitical events that may, uh, you know, occur from this point on. You know, it's that demand side effect. And we do think that, uh, you know, on a quarterly basis, on a year on year right. basis, we can get to that 2% pretty quickly. The high frequency economics China report is always worth reading. Dovetail the China inflation dynamic over to what that does to Jerome Powell's America. Uh, you know, there is that, uh, you know, what uh, what we're importing in terms of inflation from China. But really, it's, you know, that domestic component that we're worried about right now, right, in the U.S., uh, in terms of services inflation. And we are seeing a deceleration. It's just that we're not seeing it as quickly as we had expected, especially that housing component. You know, if you look at the spending patterns, services spending has sort of stabilized at that 2%. You know, if you look at the quarter to date average, versus the you know, third quarter and what happened in the third quarter. But it's just that uh, you know, rates of change in core services inflation are just so elevated. And that's the component uh, that needs to really settle the more substantially. We think that housing component is going to come through uh, going forward. Rabita, we spoke to Renaissance Macro yesterday, and they all think that it's the end of the vibe session. They're pointing to consumer and business confidence beginning to pick up. Do you see any potential whatsoever that we could get a pickup in the economy again as we start to progress through this year? Uh, you know, there's a lot that is going to go right for households and businesses in 2024. Uh, we are going to see, you know, right now, you know, the consumer is starting to feel a little bit better. Inflation is going to continue to come down. Wages and, and uh, incomes are still rising, and real wages and incomes are rising. So there's a lot that is positive for households, and it's a lot that's a pos positive that is positive for businesses because interest rates are going to go down, that policy stance is going to become less restrictive, and credit conditions and financial conditions are going to ease. So we do think that there is a chance that uh, there will be upside surprises in the economy. It's just that in the very near term. Are households going to step back because they think interest rates are going to go down and therefore they're going to hold back on purchases of, you know, let's say cars, houses, you know, that is what we're trying to figure out. Where is that dynamic in the first quarter, in the second quarter until the Fed actually, you know, takes that first step? Rubita, I often ask this question and I think it's more important now because there's so much data out there that's in conflict, <laughs> leading indicators, soft data versus hard. As you look across your dashboard, what are you putting more weight on? What's the better guide for you? Uh, we are squarely focused on the labor market. Uh, we have been looking at the inflation numbers, of course, that's been, uh, you know, uh, in focus. But now we are focused on the labor market. Is there going to be a more substantial deceleration? Because that has implica implications for how households are going to respond. We still think, you know, our baseline projection is that 
job growth is going to remain positive. Unemployment rate might tick up a little bit, but you know, since early 2022, that unemployment rate has been below 4%. So, you know, we don't think that there's going to be a surge there, but we are focused on the labor market in terms of are there the lags effect, right. lagged effects of policy that, uh, you know, are going to show up now. To go on Michael McKee on your Rubila, are, are you going to be looking at month over month dynamic, year over year dynamic of the data tomorrow? In, in what way do you look at the annualized data? Is it three-month annualized at high-frequency e- economics, or does Carl Weinberg and you do you have some secret sauce? Uh, we are looking at the month-on-month trend, but we are also, you know, Fed Chair Powell, he, you know, emphasized that six-month, you know, the annualized change from six months ago, we, months ago, we are also looking at that. I think you have to look at everything. You have to look at where the quarterly change is. You know, our estimates suggest that that six-month annualized change is going to tick up a little bit. That might catch the market's attention, you know, the December numbers. But, uh, you know, there's a whole host of things that we are looking at, uh, you know, including the month-on-month, the year-on-year. You know, for us, it's all about that target is a year-on-year change, right? I mean, and that's what we are focused on. So how will the Fed fold into this? I, I was reading something last night. I'm sorry, folks, I can't cite it. Looking towards March or even a, a, a rate cut earlier than that. Where are you actually on a rate cut off of your guesstimate for tomorrow? Uh, we think the Fed is going to, the first rate cut is going to come in June. Uh, you know, we think that the inflation picture is going to improve substantially and that they, by, by uh, June, you know, they will have enough information in terms of uh, how restricted that policy rate is becoming, you know, progressively more restrictive as inflation comes down. And then by June that they're going to, you know, feel that there's enough progress on the labor market that, uh, you know, that policy rate does not need to be as overly restrictive. That's what they're very sensitive to. Our f- first projection is June. If inflation surprises to the down, uh, downside more than what we are expecting, then it's certainly possible that they're going to move earlier. Rabila, thanks for the update and the insight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Rabila Faruqi there of High Frequency Economics. Evercore ISI, Tom, just out with their 2024 market outlook. A good friends over at Evercore. This is their view on central banks. They've nav- navigated a soft landing thus far. We foresee inflation receding more rapidly than anticipated. It leads us to predict a rate reduction starting in Q2. Alongside basically what Rabila just said there. Yeah, this is important because of where it's coming from in the process. And like Alan Greenspan, Edward S. Hyman is looking at granular data. I can't say enough how important it is for Evercore ISI to look at what trucking's doing, what are railroads doing, and other esoteric stuff nobody ever. You know, we're all looking at who's speaking today at the Fed. Ed Hyman's not looking looking at what John Williams is going to say. He wants to know what trucks are doing in Little Rock. I'm listening to what John Williams has got to say later this afternoon. There's a couple of things you can say, Tom, that on the surface sound contradictory. We need to stay restrictive, right? But then we can deliver rate cuts, rate reductions. I don't think they are that contradictory. And I wonder if John Williams entertains that conversation a little bit later this afternoon. As inflation starts to come in, can you deliver those surgical rate cuts and at the same time keep rates restrictive without letting them become more restrictive. With him, with his speech writers, and he's so competent, he's going to curate in their different ideas. And I wonder how much the fiscal dynamic in QT will slip into his speech. I think, I think people want to hear from a monetary theorist about the Yellen world, about what QT dynamics would be best. And the sequencing. I think after the minutes last week, just the feeling, Tom, you take away QT before you start reducing interest rates. Then when you start talking about reducing interest rates, you think less about nominal, you really start to focus, Tom, on what's happening with real rates and try and keep things pretty steady. Yeah, I, I have to admit it. John Williams has been the there screen. before. I think that's going to be the conversation <clears throat> later again, perhaps. Everything on the screen, John, I'm looking at the real rate, the 10 year real rate coming in a little. Equities unchanged on the S&P 500. Coming up very shortly, Jefferies with the latest on the Boeing near disaster of the last few days. More on that still to come from New York. This is Bloomberg. We're going to approach this, number one, acknowledging our mistake. We are going to approach it with 100% and complete transparency every step of the way. We're going to work with the NTSB, who is investigating the accident itself, to find out 
what the root cause is. I have a long experience with this group. They're as good as it gets. It's a strong address from the Boeing CEO, Dave Calhoun, speaking in a company-wide meeting to address the incident involving its 737 MAX 9 plane. More on that in just a moment. From New York City this morning, good morning. Welcome to the program. If you are just waking up, this is how the scene is set for you this morning. No drama on the equity market, totally unchanged on the S&P 500. The bond market not doing much either. Yields lower by a few basis points, 399.43. Tom and I will talk a lot about the calendar for the next few days. We'll hear from the New York Fed President John Williams later on this afternoon, the Fed speak starts to pick up going into the cpi data tomorrow morning onto ppi on friday and on friday bank earnings season really kicking off jp morgan bank of america and a whole host of others tom still to come through the week i'm in a camp these giants including jp morgan capturing someone said one out of five profit dollars in banking they're going to slide through this and try to not admit how much they're making what's going to be interesting and i talked to chanelle basic about this last night is with the BlackRock news, which we really haven't addressed yet, what is the the right sizing, the cost efficiencies tone going to be? I think that's going to be literally. I'm not sure they know what they're going to say on a Wednesday. What they're going to say on Friday. job cuts, three percent of global workforce, 600 employees. I have to say, TK absolutely nailed it yesterday. It was something you said. This is what you were looking for. Now, yeah. Tom, we're going to see more of that from the other players. This uh, is about asset management. Some of the big shifts that they're starting to see in asset management. I just wonder if you see it elsewhere in financial services. Asset management, and maybe as a gossip idea, ESG and all that struggle. But, John, what's important here is this is not some annual layoff at John Deere or Caterpillar. They did a layoff, I believe, 12 months ago. They did a mini layoff somewhere out there. I can't remember. Again, Chanelli would know that. And the answer, sum them up, 3% plus 4% plus whatever. It adds up. And you get into, it, it adds up to a real number. And Larry Fink, with this quote, Tom, I'll just round it up with that. We see our industry changing faster than at any time <clears throat> since the founding of BlackRock. That's quite a statement, isn't it, off well, the back of that decision? It's going to be interesting to say the least. Where are they made? Where are Boeing aircraft made? I believe it's Renton, Washington, where they were tuned into the college football game here a while back. The 737 comes out of Renton, Washington. An expert on that is Sheila Keglu, Senior Equity Research Analyst at Jefferies, and joins us this morning. Have you been to Renton, Washington? I have. There's three production lines. The third one just opened up. So if you think about it, each one of those churns out 15 to 17 maxes per month. The fourth one will open next year in Everett, about an hour and a half uh, away from Renton. So. so I want you to speak, and I don't want you to talk about all your leverage finance work at J.P. Morgan and your wonderful work at Jeffries, your award-winning work in institutional investor. Forget about it. Our listeners and viewers want to know, where's the problem and is it easy to fix? Is it Renton, Washington, or is it the fuselage riveters in Kansas? I think the problem is the pandemic deteriorated the air, aerospace workforce. Not so much, and I mean, the problem is in Renton, not only at the Boeing factory, but the small tier three, tier four suppliers around there. They're seeing strain on their workforce. The problem has been really focused over the last year in Spirit in Wichita uh, with three incidents either on the MAX or the 87 involving quality issues. So there's been management changes there to address those quality issues. And I think that's really the focus item given we've seen small improvements in the engine manufacturers and the tier three guys. This sounds absolutely shocking when I start to hear about this. Lisa asked this question earlier in the week. I'd love your response to it. Are we suggesting that things are safe but not as safe as they were before the pandemic now in this industry? I think the industry is having a tough time recruit, you know, getting back up to post pandemic levels. And, you know, we're manufacturing in September. We were only manufacturing in the teens a month on these maxes when we were supposed to be at 38 a month. So we essentially, you know, in December deliveries were 44. Half of that was out of inventory. Half of it was actual production. So we basically doubled output in three months, right? We were trying to double output. So there's a strain given air traffic is back to 100% of 2019 levels to get this aircraft production back. And it was very constrained over the last three years. You've nailed it. Demand at Boeing isn't the problem, it's deliveries. We had Ryanair's Michael O'Leary sit in your seat, actually, at the end of last year, complaining about the delays to the 737 MAX getting delivered to Ryanair. How close are we to further delays and ultimately cancelled orders because of what's taking place? I'm sure he was more entertaining than me in this seat, <laughs> I will tell you that. He's more entertaining than I am, don't worry about it. Um, you know, what we've seen is that we've seen a delivery slip. Um, we were, we 
delivered about 1,000 aircraft in 22. That number was 1,500 post-pandemic on the narrow body. So we've seen that happen already, but we're not going to see cancellations. Uh, we are seeing the order book stretch out 28, 29. Everybody wants to get in line. And even Ryanair, who's been the most outspoken against Boeing, has talked about wanting that aircraft sooner and pricing being better for them, uh, pricing being better for Boeing on some of the Ryanair aircraft because they want the aircraft sooner. What's the opportunity here for Airbus? I mean, I mean just as simple. In Toulouse, they got to play this low. It could be them. I get the whole dance. But is this a huge strategic opportunity in the United States of America for unit sales for Airbus? Not so much. Uh, I think the opportunity was from 2019 to 23, 22. Uh, when the MAX was essentially grounded, not delivering to China as well. We're, we're forgetting about that China element, but Airbus had their market share opportunity. So what we see in 25 is Boeing produces 50 MAXs a month and Airbus does 75. Maybe in the 2026 time frame is more likely to be honest. So they already have that market share game. And let's not forget, Airbus has its own issues. The Airbus aircraft is man has two engine options, either the GE Leap option and the Raytheon GTF option. Mm -hmm. We know the GTF has a contaminated powder in it, so they're basically grounding 40% of the GTF engines in the first half of this year to do inspections on them. So Airbus is not short of its issues as well. Okay, so some of this is the complexity of the engineering across all of aviation. Are we at a point now, in an I mean, I get the COVID idea, I think that's brilliant, but are we at a point where these things are becoming too complex? Some argue it's not complex enough, not enough fuel efficiency, uh, not enough energy efficiency to pilots to fly, fly the plane. So I think that what we've seen in the aircraft industry is no new models, really. This is the 2020s are just an upgrade of the existing models. Working and in the fuel efficiency, that, but are, you are they still trying to do a one pilot plane? I, I think that's off the books for now. The focus has really been on the engine, the fuel efficiency, and what kind of engine we get in the 2035, 2040 timeframe, and how that aircraft takes us over the next two to three decades. The sitting of the jet back and forth on the wing was due to fuel efficiency, right? Should we jettison fuel efficiency is an engineering mandate? That's what we're aiming for, but clearly the engine OEMs have had a lot of trouble, not only in production, but the efficiency that they're gaining. So not calling out GTF only with the Raytheon issues, not only do they have the contaminated powder, they've needed to do upgrades to get their engine up to par, so has Leap. So that's what we're going through She's confidence right building. <laughs> Let's finish on the regulator. <laughs> this is a difficult one. How do you expect the regulator to respond to this? How do authorities step in here, given what could have taken place on Friday? So, John, you started off very stark contrast with Dave Calhoun yesterday, and I think the regulators took that same message. NTSB is solely focused on the accident. We'll know in 12 to 18 months what really happened. The FAA said grounding. 12 hours in, so did EASA. So I think that they're taking a stark stance. Boeing has this directive out on how to inspect the aircraft. And I think we could see the aircraft back in the air by the end of next week. The end of next week, that quickly? The directive said four to eight hours to inspect the aircraft. You think about just the PR element of it, an extra week. When you hear from the regulator, of course, they have to start out really broad. Actually have all options open, TK, consider everything. Sheila, do you get the sense that they've narrowed this investigation down already then, given your expectation we'll be back up in the air next week? Uh, so the NTSB, I think, will take a year to come to a conclusion on exactly what uh. happened, what the cause was. But the FAA seems pretty confident that the directive came out so quickly. 30 seconds, normal conversation. What's your single best buy right now? Oh, this amazing <laughs> company called Heiko. Uh, when I started... What is it called? It's called Heiko. Heiko. Yes, 21 billion market cap, 51 times PE. Um, but when I first started covering this stock, and I won't tell you when that was, the market cap was $2 billion. Um, they are a generic aircraft parts manufacturer, and they supply the aftermarket. The more we don't get new aircraft deliveries, uh, the more Heiko benefits, because the old planes get serviced. Interesting. I thought we were going to round out that conversation, sort of long bowing but we didn't. Sheila, thank you. No problem. It's good to hear from you. Just fantastic. Real depth to that conversation. Sheila Kayolu there of Jefferies on the latest situation, Tom. Difficult. Just super, super difficult. I have to say, Dave yeah. Calhoun, that address was pretty powerful yesterday, Tom. Yeah. Really taking on how serious this moment could have been. And I'm sure he's listening to the experts like Sheila as well. This is what surveillance is about, John. Let's talk to adults like Brooke Sutherland and Sheila. I mean, that's how you get it done. We'll talk to Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management up next on the program, looking for volatility in the front half of this year and a rally in the second half. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
I'm still very bullish for 2024, but I do think it's going to be very different to the rally we saw last year. The broader theme we're seeing right now is there's some structural changes in the market. I actually think it's the economic downturn that's the biggest risk that's not priced into markets. The markets are now back to this good news on the economic front which is causing yields to back up, being sort of bad news on the equity front. There are times to be concerned about the outlook. Right now is not one of those times. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, totally unchanged. It's a no drama kind of morning on Wall Street. The drama safe for yesterday afternoon after the close. Let's pull up Bitcoin and take another look at that drama-filled afternoon. TK, at one point it felt like on Twitter, the SEC had granted approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs. And then we find out 10, 15 minutes later, it's all a hoax. It's all a hoax, and we stagger into Wednesday, and I guess we're supposed to get something today. I'll say tomorrow. I'm not. I mean, possibly. Really who knows? Sure. After 45, yesterday, forty-five thousand. But Eric Belchunas, who's truly expert, folks. Eric Belchunas, an ETF expert at Bloomberg, is like industry leading. I think is a statement we can make, and he says there's this raging debate about how much cash is going to go into this. And he's like, you know, a modest amount, 15, 20 gajillion, and others are saying 100 gajillion. And there's a, no one really knows the wall of money that's going to go into this. Well, here's what we know so far about yesterday, and it won't take me long because we don't know much at all. From the SEC, they said the tweet was an unauthorized tweet. X saying the breach was not due to any issues with its systems, going on to say, Tom, the account didn't have two-factor authentication enabled at the time of the incident. So all round, plenty of embarrassment to share, but particularly for the SEC. I think it's going to be interesting to see the embarrassment between the chairman and those around him on the committee, uh, Republicans and Democrats. There's a lot of notional Republicans at the SEC saying, let's go free enterprise, Bitcoin should be part of the game. And there's a few other people, including the chairman, saying, uh, maybe not. And that's the crux of the debate and the unknown unknown this Wednesday morning. Close to 46K this morning. <clears throat> Had a print of that in the last 24 hours or so. We can get back to business here on Wall Street later on today, TK. Tons to talk about going into tomorrow. I think really a two-part story. You start to get the economic data, <clears throat> one. You start to get yeah. the earnings on Friday, two. That's the next couple of days. Yeah, it's going to be you know, a day to del you. Del I'll get three, two. Deluge. Got it out. Thank you. Nice. Del you know, yeah, it's, it's going to be one of her. I worry. can't spell it. I can say it. And the answer is there's going to be a wall of data coming here. And to your point, economic and global Wall Street, I'm more focused, frankly, on what we're going to see in global Wall Street because the pros are telling me company by company we're lowballing everything and maybe there's going to be a lift to it. We'll have to see. Let's get to the scores this morning. Yeah. Equity futures totally unchanged <clears> on the <throat> S&P 500. Futures going nowhere. Yields coming in a basis point or two, 399.80 on a 10-year in and around 4% for the last few sessions. Just some stability going into the data we get tomorrow morning. Looking at the <coughs> FX market, the euro just slightly stronger, but still in and around 109.50 at 109.46. That currency pair positive by 0.14%. That's the price action. Here's the day ahead. Here's the brief this morning. Fed speak. John Williams, 3.15 this afternoon. The New York Fed president coming up a little <coughs> bit later on today, Tom. Then on to tomorrow, yeah. Loretta Mester with Michael McKee at 11.30. Don't miss that conversation. You'll hear from Kashkari on Friday. Love, love this mix here. And this is what America's about, folks, and all our different Fed presidents and governors. Kashkari is an aerospace engineer. He's got a much more corporate view. His public service with PIMCO, I should say. His private service with PIMCO. Loretta Mester is a mathematician. And John Williams is original economic literature with Lubbock Williams about guesstimating where that our start is. Just the message changed, Tom, particularly in anticipation of the <clears throat> data we get tomorrow. For John Williams, what else can he really say? CPI coming up tomorrow morning, yeah. 8.30 yeah. Eastern time. We know from Williams what he had to say after the news conference with Chairman Powell. What was that message? We're not really talking about well, rate cuts at the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and I would go back fundamentally to his belief, at least through now, where he's looking for us to return to a more quiescent, let's say as a generalization, 2% level. And there's some huge pushback, whether it's former Vice Chairman Richard Clarida suggesting a higher level of 2%, and others, including folks. This, this, I'll get, I put it out last night, but Ken Rogoff on Project Syndicate, it's a blistering pre-Davos note. What did Ken say? Ken basically says we're going to set at higher interest rates. He cites Barry Eichengreen's Jackson Hole 
essay on debt, and Ken Rogoff just says they got it wrong, wrong, wrong. We're going to see a higher rate regime. Interesting. Last week, when we had the first program of the year, the three of us were sitting around the table and we said we're really hitting the ground running to start 2024, and we are for earnings as well. On Friday, you'll get earnings from JP Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all reporting. That's the big event, Tom. After the data on Thursday, it's on to earnings. <clears throat> So, uh, well, the thing I'd center out here is Citigroup's uh, Srinatarajan and company with a great long essay on Mike Mayo, who's a good friend of the show. He's been doing this for a few years, and Mayo's up on the table pounding by Jane Frazier, by, by City. Citigroup. By and, City. I, you know, if, if you're not really focused on this, folks, and you want to see some fireworks, consider Mike Mayo with a double on beleaguered Citigroup out X number of years. Interesting. Let's catch up with Seema Shah, the Chief Global Strategist at Principal Asset Management. Seema, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Seema, great to catch up. Two-part story this year for you. First half, second half. First half volatility, second half rally. I have to say, it reminds me of some of the outlooks that I got last year for 2023. Seema, what is it about 2024 where you think that story could actually take place? So I think that, look, if you, if you think about where we were at the end of last year, where you had... Um, I think a price per perfection, you know, you couldn't get better news than the idea that the Fed would start cutting it early in this year, uh, you would have a soft landing, etc. Now, I'm not saying that that's not all going to come true, but at the beginning of this year, you're already seeing the market push back on some of those original expectations about early Fed cuts. Uh, you're seeing economic <clears throat> resilience. That is creating a wobble. Um, and I struggle to see what is going to be the catalyst to drive another leg up in the near term. You almost need to see a bit of a pullback um, as the market starts to question their rate expectations. And then as you get towards the middle of the year and you get closer to that actual rate cut date, you see an economic slowdown, but it doesn't turn out to be too too damaging. Uh, that to me is that green signal for a more prolonged rally. You see a dovetail nominal GDP now, that combination of real GDP plus the inflation with the IMF's call of a, a beleaguered slow global economy out four years to 2028. Where are we in that continuum as we go into 2024? Is there an animal spirit within our nominal GDP or is it gonna drift away? So look, we are anticipating a bit of a global growth slowdown. You know, if you look across the US, Europe, China, it's not particularly exciting, but you do have a couple of bright spots around the globe. But we're not anticipating a very you know, prolonged economic weakness. So I think this is a fairly decent nominal growth environment. Uh, but along with that comes the idea that we don't necessarily see inflation coming all the way back down to 2% or below 2% like you saw um, in previous years. So from a real rate, which I know you've been focused on, it is a slightly more challenging environment than we've seen in previous years. And I think investors need to start taking that into to consideration um, as they're starting to position their portfolios. What does the real rate do this year, the 10-year inflation-adjusted rate in the United States? So we're expecting to come down slightly, but not too much. Um, if I give you an idea, you know, we're expecting the Fed to cut up uh, three times 25 basis points each time, so it's not very significant. We are expecting inflation to come down to around the 2.4% level, so it's not too far from where we are today. Um, that is a little bit still quite restrictive. Uh, so you're not in a fantastic environment for risk assets, but there is a lot of cyclical factors that we can take into consideration. It's just if you're thinking about your portfolio, you're looking at a higher cost of capital than you've had in the last decade or so. So you need to be um, kind of screening your, your stocks a little bit closer. Um, you need to be thinking a little bit more about bonds as well, you know, in terms of it's great in inflationary, sorry, in a disinflationary scenario, uh, but in an inflationary scenario where inflation doesn't come all the way back down to what maybe was accustomed to before, bonds don't necessarily perform as well as you would have expected. I wonder what your call is then on consumer discretionary. I'll share with you what we heard from Laurie Cavasina of RBC overnight. Upgrading discretionary to market weight and saying this, Seema, we're wary of being underweight going forward given the tendency of this sector to outperform when interest rates are falling. There are two sectors at the moment that are kind of leading the pack to close out last year and whenever we rally it's discretionary it's tech where are you on the former and for that matter where are you on the latter so actually on the consumer discretionary i'm not too negative i do think there are challenges coming for consumers but i don't think they're as significant as maybe a lot of people including myself uh, were worried about at the end of last year there's just a lot going for consumers at the moment i um, mean as long as the labor market is holding up as strong as it is 
then I think consumer discretionary can do well. On the tech side, I still have good, I guess, solid expectations for tech. I do worry, though, about whether the expectations from the market is going to be fulfilled. So whereas I wouldn't want to go negative or underweight technology, I think there are other parts of the market which are a little bit more interesting for 2024. If, as you said, you're going to see Fed cuts and a soft landing, I think there are other parts of the market can do well. Well, talk to me about the other parts then. What's the big call for you? Banks, where do they fit in, given we get earnings on Friday? I think banks can do pretty well. I think, you know, as, as you're going to see in a lot of parts of the market, there are headwinds in the first half of the year. But as you get through to the second, then I think uh, banks can do well. The other part of the market, which I think should be gaining interest, there's going to be a bit of a wobble in the first uh, quarter, at least. But small caps, I think their valuations are very attractive. Typically, when you get a Fed cutting cycle and it's accompanied by um, a kind of return to or at least solid growth, that is typically a very good signal for, for small caps. And when you're looking at that valuation gap between the large and the small cap, it is very attractive. So I think this is a time that investors should start thinking about it and maybe yeah. edging into those positions. If yields come down, is the, is the flow of money out of money market funds, it's assumed, is it linear or does it all come in one great surge? I think that's, it's really difficult to say in terms of how the investor sentiment is going to go. What I do think, though, is one is that those money market funds, they do have the potential to create a pretty strong rally. Um, once some of the questions that investors have hanging over them are answered. So those questions would include, when is the Fed going to start reducing interest rates? And the second thing is, is, is there going to be an economic slowdown? And if there is an economic slowdown, how devastating is it going to be? I think all three of those questions are going to be answered fairly um, from a, in a positive tilt in that there's a slowdown, but it's not too devastating at all. And I think once you have some of those questions answered, then money market funds, that trickle is going to move towards those risk assets which is one of the reasons why I do think investors should be positioning for a stronger second half of the year. Russ Kostrick of BlackRock said something similar an hour ago. Seema, thank you. Good to hear from you. Seema Shadda of Principal Asset Management. If you are just joining us, welcome to the programme. The scores look like this on the S&P 500, almost totally unchanged, positive by 0.04%. Yield to lower by a single basis point on a 10-year, 3.99%. 80. There's a ton to talk about this morning. We've got CPI data coming out tomorrow morning, PPI on Friday. We've got the earnings as well. We talked a lot about numbers coming from JP Morgan, Bank of America and Citi to close out this week. A lot to talk about with Michael Purvis of Tallback and Capital Advisors. We'll do that in the next hour. Later this hour, two conversations stand out for us, Tom. We've got to talk about <coughs> Bitcoin. We can do that with Kenny yeah. Greifeld around this table. And the latest down in Washington, D.C. as Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis face off on CNN. And yeah. you get some counter programs in from the former president Donald Trump on Fox News. That's quite an evening it's, later it's on. It's going to be quite an evening on the caucuses as the silly season uh, begins. Moments ago, Eric Belchunas, James Safer, Bloomberg Intelligence, quote, BlackRock may break the first day flow record with a possible $2 billion asset injection on the first day of trading for spot Bitcoin ETF. Haven't we already bought that rumor in this market? given the move that we've seen I would in Bitcoin so. already? I, as a complete amateur on Bitcoin, and everyone knows how I feel about this, I would suggest, yeah, it's in the price. Kelly Greifat is not an amateur. She joins us at yeah. about 7.45, Absolutely. so about 30 minutes from now. Down in Washington, tons to discuss. Just around this table, about five minutes away, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern to break down what on earth has been going on in the presidential race for 2024. And Tom, also, the mystery around <clears throat> the defence secretary is a mystery no, no more. The defence secretary is sick. He is ill. And that's what happens. But it was the way it was handled. I mean, no question about it. I'm really interested about the I.O. caucus. i got to get up to speed on that. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern up next from New York City this morning. <coughs> Equity futures just slightly positive on the S&P 500. Good morning. Four nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. We continue to stand with Israel. 
in ensuring that October 7th can never happen again. We believe the submission against Israel to the International Court of Justice distracts the world from all of these important efforts. And moreover, the charge of genocide is meritless. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking in Tel Aviv after meeting with Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other top officials. Blinken continuing his trip with a visit to the West Bank later on today. From New York City, welcome to the program. Your equity market shaping up as follows. The scores look like this on the S&P, totally unchanged. Yield to lower by a few basis points. We're down almost two to 399.43. Crew's just quiet, Tom. It's just quiet. Everything else is really loud in the Middle East, and crude is quiet. 72.37, well, positive 0.2%. Yeah, Francisco Blanche was great on that the other day. Also, Jeff Curry showing up, retired. Uh, I saw him on Bloomberg TV as well. And the answer is the U.S. has gummed it all up. They, I guess there's a global price, and there's a global distribution. We had a great brief from Norway yesterday, but the answer is supplies come on with a vengeance. And that's kept the price. Where would the price be without the United States? Without 13 I million barrels a day. I haven't seen day. this. Oh, I haven't seen this study. to think. Done as, done as well, but uh, there it is. And then uh, further quiescence, 109.47 on uh, euro. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go to what somebody said the other day. Lagarde's got a huge opportunity to reframe over the next 10 days her view on what they do with disinflation in a beleaguered, really beleaguered Germany and the continent of Europe. Yeah, the inflation story's yeah. improved, but the growth backdrop has been pretty tough. Brutal. I mean, pretty brutal, brutal, Tom, compared to what yeah. we've experienced here in America over the last 12 mm. months. We'll have full coverage of that next week uh, as well. Right now joining us, uh, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, Amory Horton, who has been southeast of Des Moines to Hayesville, Iowa, population 41. <laughs> it's romantic as all get out. It is a population decline of 20% in one census, 18% in another sentence. The deep, as Bernard Balin, the historian said, the depeopling of America. They got the West Lancaster Schoolhouse. They're gonna hold the caucus in Hayesville, Iowa, in a gun store surrounded by firearms. You know, that's what you do yeah. in Iowa when you're pheasant hunting, I guess. That's where this process starts for Republicans, isn't it? Yes, it starts in these caucuses, which is really more of an experience than, say, a primary vote where you just stop by your local elementary school, cast your ballot and leave and it's very <clears throat> private. Things could change in the room as these discussions are taking place. And this is why in the past few speeches you've heard from the former president, who's leading by real clear politics, a 36 point margin in Iowa. He oh. wants to win in a very big way. And he's coming out and saying, to, when he's speaking to Iowa voters, he's saying at these rallies, it's not enough that you support me. You all have to right. go out to these caucuses because he wants to make a statement. Okay, he wants our, to make a statement to Haley and DeSantis. For our international audience, including foreigners like me in New York City, in Iowa, is there a sense of intimidation within a caucus in Hayesville, Iowa, population 41, where there's a zeitgeist, and let's presume it's for the former president. I'm just guessing. I haven't researched this a la Greg Giroux. But the answer is, are they, how dare you vote for Biden or how dare you vote for Haley? I mean, it's not just a vote, is it? No, that's what I'm talking about. It is an experience. It is a debate. And things can change in the room, a la Ted Cruz in the past was able to win. Things can change in the room for these individuals. Do they do this in the United Kingdom? Do you have What well, you've just described, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. There's no gun shops in the United Kingdom, Tom. So yeah, it's, it's the venue TK. for the venue for one would be very different. Let's talk about the debate later on this evening, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Governor DeSantis going up against Nikki Haley one on one, head to head. At the same time, counter programming on Fox News, the former president, Donald Trump. What's that going to look like later on this evening? Well, you're going to it's going to be a big test, really, of how far DeSantis and Haley are going to go in attacking Trump, who's deciding to skip this debate. He skipped all of them and he's doing a big counter programming because he's going on Fox News, where a lot of Republicans traditionally watch and in making his final pitch for these Iowa caucus goers to come out and vote for him. So I want to see how much they're willing to go against the former president and how much they're going to go against each other. You know, Nikki Haley has shined in all these debates when she got into these moments with Vivek Ramaswamy. He He's not going to be there. Chris Christie's not going to be there to goat them on to go against Trump. So for me, it really feels like for DeSantis or Haley, this is make or break for their ca campaigns. Haley recently had a, a fumble and then Ron DeSantis called it a word salad when she would talk about slavery with the Civil War. Can she move past that in this debate? And for Ron DeSantis, he's put all his eggs in Iowa, all his capital, capital, all his personnel. He needs to do well at this debate tonight. There was some reporting that if things don't go well for him in Iowa, 
he drops out. What have we heard from the actual campaign? Well, they're not going to say they're going to drop out right now. It's full steam ahead for Iowa. But you know, what does he do after Iowa? His numbers ha don't look great in New Hampshire. Nikki Haley is dominating in New Hampshire in terms of everyone besides Trump. Um, and Chris Christie's doing quite well in New Hampshire as well. So you could see a moment if Ron DeSantis was to pull out, potentially even Chris Christie was to pull out, and she is, to able, she is able to win New Hampshire, then we'd actually have a primary. But at the moment, Trump is still dominating the field. This is domestic politics. Let's talk about international issues. We've talked a lot about what happened, what didn't happen with the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. It's really important because of what's happening on the ground, in the Red Sea, mm -hmm. in the Middle East, across the region. What we're learning this morning is that Houthi rebels launched one of the most complex attacks in the Red Sea to date, and U.S. forces and allies have been shooting down 18 drones and a barrage of missiles. Just how tense are things in the Red Sea at the moment? Things are incredibly tense, which is why you see all these container ships not going through the Red Sea, which is actually going to be adding, you're talking about inflation data tomorrow, at some point this will be adding to price in the bottom line of these companies and then trickle down to consumers. Uh, things are incredibly tense in the Red Sea and the administration, we have seen them hit back. There's interceptions, but we have not seen them go after Houthis in Yemen. And potentially that could be the next step. Okay. The, the, the next step here assumes policy from the United States. Is our policy postponed or paused because of the uproar at the Pentagon? Is, it, is, is all you're reporting that things are normal in that debate and communication? Absolutely, things continue. It is, it is a machine. But there is a lot of drama right now and concern about the communication between the Pentagon and the White House, given the absence of Lloyd Austin. And the fact of the matter is, yesterday when the world found out that Lloyd Austin's elective procedure, which means a patient decided to undergo this procedure, but that also meant when you're thinking about it, elective procedure has this nuance that potentially this isn't so serious. But yes. yesterday we found out that this is serious. At the same time, the President of the United States, the same day the President of the United States found out it was prostate cancer, so did the world. Shocking. And th this, is, this is a big problem. This communication breakdown isn't new. You've reported on it. Just give us an idea of what's actually happening within the administration, why there continues to be a breakdown seemingly between <coughs> the White House and departments like the State Department, the Pentagon. What is happening? This administration came in and said, we are going to be very transparent. We are the adults in the room, and we are going to go back to process and procedure, something that they said was lacking under the Trump administration under four years. What we've seen from the fall of Kabul on was that they struggle with interagency. They are very insular within the White House. When you have individuals who should be the trans really the transportation highway of information flowing into the White House and out of the White House, it does seem like that's where things seem to break down with this administration. And that is the biggest criticism against them. Just a massive breakdown. <clears throat> AMH, great to have you with us in the city here in New York. Anne-Marie Hilton and breaking down the situation, Tom, in Washington. It's going to be interesting to see in a Washington across the sea to shining sea, as the cliche goes. And I'm fascinated by the path from Iowa to New Hampshire to the many states sued for Tuesday, I believe, March 5th. We're talking about Hayesville, Iowa, deep southeast of Des Moines and all. 41 is the population. A house near there for sale, four bedrooms, 2,100 square feet. John, it's yours for $179,000. I looked at equivalent in Larchmont, New York, 930,000. <laughs> That's the difference in America. And that, you know, Anne-Marie and our team, they're looking at that massive polarity in real estate or in voting. Tom's been trying to get me to move ever since I moved here, which is like the last <laughs> nine years. And what TK's been pushing for a long time was taking me back to London, but now you've settled on Larchmont. Oh, no, I think okay, Larchmont... I'm allowed, I'm allowed just outside of Manhattan. You By and, the water, I appreciate you know, you that You and Matt well. Miller can have, you know, a $200 breakfast on Saturday. I think they've got a nice yacht club over there. <clears throat> they Make do. That they're very yachty. Thank you. At least you get more space if you look at real estate in Manhattan for that price. Mm -hmm. Live from New York City, here are the scores on the S&P 500, almost totally unchanged. A snoozy morning so far, which is good yeah, news, considering up. some of the drama we've had over the last few months. We're positive by 0 
7% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.19%. The Russell, the small caps, Tom, up a tenth. It's morning, but as I open the show, the VIX, 12.85. I'm sorry, the gloom crew's out there in force. World's coming to an end. We're going down. First couple of days, we're ugly, ugly, ugly. It's a bull market VIX. There's no other way to put it. I, you know, as a joke, I love to get John going on this, folks. The drawdown in the Dow Jones Industrial Average off of last year is half a percent. I appreciate the update. Thank really you. Do. I mean, you turn to the bond market. Boeing affected there, I should say. Think how much worse it would be if this 10-year was still at five, if this two-year was still 525, 526, which is where we were for about a heartbeat in the month of October. <laughs> we're back down to 398.86 on a 10-year. Tom, down a couple of basis points on a two-year, down two or three to 433.50. And, and, you know, as Torsten Slock, moments ago, Torsten Slock is out saying the standard deviation, the variance, if you will, the variance in forecasting, John, he's never seen. And, and, you know, we're living that. You and I are living that day to day. I Bramble's couldn't agree more. No, Bramble's Tom, I couldn't agree more. If you go back to the forecast for year end on the S&P 500, the high and the low, there's a 1,000 point spread. <coughs> 4,200 yeah. out to 5,200. Let's finish on foreign exchange on the euro, which has been sleepy. That's for sure. The euro against the dollar, 109.49, Tom. We're positive by 0.17% on that currency pair. Yeah, you know, Anne-Marie Horton sat down and said, Tom, should we really go to Brasserie Leeds? Should we do that in Zurich or should we do it after we come back from Davos? And I said, no, I think the surveillance tradition is you go to Brasserie Leeds uh, in Zurich before you go to Davos and get that good $300 lunch that they have. It's like a, Can you imagine how much that Burger King is going to cost this year at the airport, at Zurich Airport? Well, the Mr. Strength, King at the, the airport, strength of the Swiss. You know, they say, good morning, Mr. King. Good to see you again. And, you know, it, it's good. It's going to be... 20 Swiss francs. Yeah, 20 Swiss francs for a number two value this meal. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, you know, That's nuts. Honest to God, what my benchmark is for Zurich Idiocy. What's that? I walk in the Hermes on the Bonstroff and I price out a bow tie. I don't buy one there. And they're forty, fifty dollars more than they are here. It's a, I didn't it's a that. weird. It's it's a weird math, as you well know in Davos. I mean, yeah, if you have ridiculous. one quaff a beverage of your choice in Davos, it's yeah, not outrageous. great, not great. Uh, let's get to the top stories under surveillance this morning. Houthi rebels are launching one of their most complex attacks in the Red Sea to date. U.S. forces and allies shooting down eighteen drones and a barrage of missiles <clears> aimed for merchant shipping lanes. U.S. Central Command confirming no injuries or damage was done. Many shipping companies have already rerouted vessels away from the Red Sea, sending ships on a longer route around southern Africa. Tom, things are getting dicey over there, that's for sure, which is why the likes of AP Molomers, the big container shipping right. giant, pulled back in the last few weeks. They pull back and go around Good Hope, which is not Cape Horn of, uh, of South America, which is far more uh, onerous, I'm told. But what's important here is Admiral Stravitas writing for Bloomberg Opinion, making very clear we have to find some form of offense besides randomly shooting down 18 drones. And what's urgent now is with the illness of a Secretary of Defense, Stravitas is on that list of people vetted. What would be a comfortable new Secretary of Defense? And the answer is, where's the offense or what kind of offense should we have? Any updates on that? We'll be sure to bring them to you. Promised you updates all morning on Boeing. Here is the latest. The CEO, <laughs> Dave Calhoun, speaking to the public yesterday as concerns grow over the safety of the 737 MAX 9 jet. All I could think about, I didn't know what happened to whoever was supposed to be in the seat next to that hole in the airplane. I got kids, I got grandkids, and so do you. This stuff matters. This stuff matters. This was a close call. U.S. regulators grounding the planes and ordering inspections after a door plug ejected from Alaska Airlines flight on Friday. Alaska and United have both found additional loose bolts during their own inspections. There's no clear timetable for the jets to be put back in service. We had a guest from Jeffries with us a little bit earlier this morning, Tom, who suggested maybe we're back in the air as soon as next week. Yeah, Sheila nailed it. She's award-winning on this. And what's great about Sheila is she's the engineer geek on it. It wasn't about buy, hold, sell. It wasn't about what's EBITDA going to do, et cetera. It was about, okay, how do you go through the process of determining where we are before you figure out 
where are we going to be in X number of months? And of course, the key thing she said is this is going to take years to really figure out. Yeah, and what changes are we going to yeah. see in the meantime at companies like, like this Boeing, weekend. Spirit Aero Systems, yeah. for that matter as well? Let's turn to financial services. I think a big headline in the last 24 hours, kind of I underplayed. Agree. For us, the, the language headline. you've heard from Larry Fink over at BlackRock, cutting 600 <clears> jobs or 3% of staff, citing rapid changes in asset management. Larry Fink writing in a memo, quote, we see our industry changing fast faster than at any time since the refounding, or rather the founding of BlackRock. Executives saying ETFs are becoming the preference for both index and active management strategies. The firm's still expecting to have a larger staff by the end of the year, despite these cuts. But you wonder how much more of this we're going to see, Tom, in the weeks and months to come. And it just doesn't stop. Major shout out to Matt Winkler and Rudder Gregorio who said we got to cover ETFs years ago at Bloomberg. And Eric Belchunas has just built that up. And what he reports is forget about the Bitcoin uproar that's out there right now, the public's uh, voting. What's interesting to me about ETFs is the basic idea of bond ETFs are just as important as equity ETFs. And that goes to BlackRock much more. The, the mystery, I believe, John, help me on this because I don't maybe I'm not up to speed. We don't know the quality or the divisions, the makeup of that 500 or 600. I can't go that granular this morning, yeah, but certainly okay. the language is pretty strong. Tom, yeah. you mentioned the iShares business. Whenever we talk about <clears> it, <throat> I always spare a thought for Bob Diamond, Barclays, and wonder what could have been if they weren't forced to sell it. What I, could have been at that bank? I totally agree. I was at one of the initial, we didn't know what an ETF was. I'm sitting at the old Federal Reserve Building in Washington and they're like, ET, what is it? You know, ET come mm. home. We did no idea what it was. And Bob Diamond and his people invented that. I'm gonna give Greg Fleming some major uh, shout out there as well. And the answer is it comes on here where four, five, six firms have just made this boom on Bitcoin. I believe Katie Greifeld saying 20 firms are going to step in right away. Katie's joining us in about 10 minutes time on the latest with the SEC and Bitcoin. Don't <coughs> miss that. Equities right now, TK, a few hours away from the opening bell, about two hours away. Equity futures positive here by not even a tenth of 1%. From debt at Barclays, Megan Graper joins us right now, global co-head of debt capital as well. What's the forecasting error right now? Torsten Slack over at Apollo writes this morning that the differences of opinion are immense. Do you see that on the desk at Barclays? We do. I mean, at 65 percent, I think there continues to be far too much confidence in this March Fed cut, um, particularly in the face of financial conditions which have eased since November and with 10-year treasuries effectively back to where we were in early August. So it's it's hard to draw too many <clears throat> conclusions from a single data point. I think Friday's employment report certainly introduced some sobering effects for the market. <clears throat> um, but I think both the participation rate, the wage data shed right. light on the potential risks that the U.S. economy might actually re-accelerate over the coming quarters. So there's certainly a debate still a very healthy playing out in the market. Unfair question, but you're wired in to try to answer it. What does the issuance calendar look like? And is now the time where big cash-laden tech puts out more debt? Well, we've got earnings blackouts to contend with, but I think, you know, similar to the, the floodgates that opened up here in, in the city overnight, you know, the investment grade markets have seen 83 billion of new issuance price over a matter of, of the last six days. Um, and we've got another lineup looking here again this morning. So um, I think across broader markets, IG has been the place where we've seen um, an ability to sort of quickly regain our footing from some of the indigestion we saw at the start of the year. And it's become a bit of a silver lining. Um, we had borrowers hitting the ground running, but equally we've been <clears throat> seeing investors finding opportunities to put significant cash balances to work. So we're already running marginally ahead of um, 2023 volumes and we're on track to exceed about 150 billion for the month of January. That would be the most active issuance we've seen since uh, May of last year. Can we just get into the character of the borrowers just a little bit more, Megan? You're fantastic at this. Is there a shortage duration bias? The companies coming to market, are they US domiciled, non-US domiciled? What do you see more of? Yeah, I mean, I think the long dated bias So what's interesting and, and what's a bit of a departure from what we saw um, during that two month rally into year end has been a shift to long end outperformance. So 10 year and longer order books are actually garnering significantly um, stronger demand than the belly of the curve, um, which had outperformed into the, the end of the year. Um, we saw that play out on yesterday's T-Mobile transaction. Um, their 30 year order book was more than seven times oversubscribed. 
that more than doubled the demand we saw in the five-year order book by comparison. So um, it's affording the ability for credit curves to flatten and creating opportunities for borrowers. Um, what's exacerbating the theme to some degree is that um, of of the supply we've seen so far, only five percent of it, even though it's been you know eye popping numbers, have been 15 years and longer. That's down about 40 percent year over year. Um, so most borrowers we're talking to are reluctant still to lock in coupons given more elevated borrowing costs, um, even if they acknowledge that it, it overall benefits the the transactions. Uh, the mix has been a slower financial calendar than we might have anticipated. Um, you tend to see about two thirds of January come from bank and finance. I think that's likely to uh, we're, we're going to see that tide turn after the big six kickoff, kickoff earnings this Friday. Um, you know, we're expecting upwards of 25 billion of supply from from that subset of borrowers, and then I think the regionals will will follow closely behind, given uh, supply expectations as they prepare for some of the regulatory debt requirements that are on hand. Megan, if you've suggested tons of supply, it's been met with decent demand. Slightly more difficult question to answer, but can you give us an idea as to where that demand is coming from, where people are taking cash and deploying it as these new issues come to market? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a yield driven bid. So I think what is um, fascinating to me is, is you think about implications for CPI later this week, for instance, we just hosted an investor roundtable. And, and what stood out to me is that the majority of investors in the room, so it's hedge funds, it's asset managers, it's insurance companies, they all said that yields here mattered more than spreads both to their continued inflows, but also to their um, current investment decisions. So I think it's fair to say data dependency will continue to be key, but we're seeing inflows yeah. from the usual suspects, insurance and pension money, but also some non-traditional yeah. players as well. Megan, quickly, I'm asking for a friend. Are you going to buy the Bitcoin ETF thing? <laughs> I'll uh, play the fifth on that one. <laughs> Thank Thank you. We'll leave it there. Just absolutely fantastic to start the week with Megan Craper of Barclays on what's happening in investment grade credit and beyond. TK, just absolute clinic there from Megan on what's happening. Yeah, the cadence you hear, though, for those of you that aren't part of Global Wall Street, there's a point on about page 28 of Frank Fabosi where you go, oh, this is hard. The bond stuff. It's hard, and there's just a totally different tone between the equity ballet and the bond at ballet. And when you hear her, if you're on the street, you know she read Fabozzi cover to cover. Without a doubt. Like, and she knows the Greek letters. And then again. And she knows the wall. What's great about her is she knows the operational procedure of, you know, it's not like Apple where you make five phone calls. There's some issuance issues where, you know, you actually got to work the paper to get it done. The brilliant Megan Graper, the global <coughs> co-head of Debt Capital Markets over at Barclays. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 almost totally unchanged, up by 0.01%. Sometimes you need mornings like these, TK. Just slow, just <coughs> a little sleepy, ahead of things picking up over the next day or so. Yeah, well, the, we're going to get the deluge, as we, we said earlier, of economics and the banks as well. But we are distracted by this Bitcoin. Where are we right now? 45,100. It's cratered down 300 points. What was it? 16,000, like a cup of coffee ago. Laidler said it was up 150% last year. Thank you for letting me know that. So you've got Bitcoin one, and we'll talk about that with Katie Grive found. Yeah. Whether we do get these spot Bitcoin ETFs, all of that stuff. And then you've just got procedures over at the SEC, Tom. And the more we learn about this, again, just another one of those issues that the account didn't have two-factor authentication yeah. enabled at the time that the account was compromised. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. You know, Still want a little bit more detail on what in happened a crypto, here. In a crypto milieu, and for, I've been hacked, folks, full disclosure, but the, the bottom line is, yeah, you know, how did I learn to do two-factor authorization? I was hacked out of Turkey. That's how I learned. Is that where it was? Did you learn that? <clears throat> yes. Is that where it was from? Yeah. Well, we believe so. What did they do? Bloomberg did a great job of informing me and the different institutions like Twitter. They really... Interesting. We take it for granted what people do up in the 14th floor. They deliver the goods on a weekend. For Without me. a doubt. Kelly Greifert's coming up very shortly on the hack of the SEC's X account ahead of a major decision on Bitcoin spot ETFs from New York. This is Bloomberg. Is Bitcoin an investable asset? Yeah, I think it is. The interesting thing about the uh, potential ETF now is it just broadens access to uh, that asset class. And it's the first, I think, of many catalysts 
that are out there. We have an Ethereum ETF coming with the Bitcoin halving coming with the Fed cutting interest rates. We've changed the counting regs in the US which will make it easier for companies to buy crypto. We've bank regs which will make it easier for banks to own crypto. You know, I can go on and on. So for the best part of 15 minutes, and that was Ben Lader of eToro, by the way, for the best part of 15 minutes, we thought maybe the SEC had given the nod to a spot Bitcoin ETF. And then, Tom, we find out that the SEC's account on X, formerly known as Twitter, had been compromised, <coughs> compromised. And X basically pointed out, Tom, that it wasn't due to any breach of their systems, that the account just did not have two-factor authentication enabled at the time that it was compromised. We're hearing that from X, by the way, and not the SEC. Yeah, well, you heard from Gary Gensler. He had a tweet out trying to explain it, and what a distraction for what I guess is a great moment, certainly a great moment for alternative investments. And I, I guess we try to get beyond it this morning. I know Eric Belchunas has been in the building since 4 a.m. He's already published $2 billion to go into BlackRock is one of the, the ideas here. I, I'm getting a liftoff feel from Eric. I don't know what that sure. means, but... No, that's where we well, are. I think there's so many dimensions to this story as well, Tom. There's, of course, Bitcoin, and we'll talk to Katie Greif out about that in a moment. Then there's the SEC, about how the SEC is going to announce decisions like this. And then there's just Twitter, <coughs> X as a platform for delivering news. How seriously people will take that platform in weeks yeah, and months to come think, around issues like this one. I'd add one add-on here, which we're not going to talk about now, which is the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission is less than enthused by, about all that. But what we're going to do is talk now about the operative moment here at 7.48 a.m. on an historic Wednesday. Katie Greifeld joins all crypto all the time. She's taught me so much because she knows I think it's just a bunch of malarkey. This is the day where it goes from malarkey to actually an investable asset. Is that right? You could make that case. Uh, the pushback to that would be if you really wanted crypto exposure right now, you've had a myriad of ways to do that. I mean, we have Bitcoin futures ETFs, but uh, you're right in saying that this is a watershed moment for the crypto industry and also for the ETF industry. I mean, this has been <coughs> attempted in some form uh, since 2013. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, it's been a very long road to get here. How does the actual money transact? Do they need new money to go in? or just say a BlackRock, I'm just picking someone big and ugly, but do they have a pool of money that at 10.02, when Alex Steele says, hey, it's official, the money's there right now. How's that work? So the way a typical ETF launch would work is that someone like BlackRock would precede the fund. So the assets that precede. you see- Precede. Yes, exactly. S-E-E-D, got it. Yeah, they'll put some money in uh, before the launch to make it look a little bit better. So the assets that you see, <clears throat> If it starts trading on Thursday, the assets that you see on Friday might not necessarily be all organic. What will be really interesting to watch is the trading volume. That's a much better measure in the first few days of how much actual interest they're in is in these funds. Why has the SEC dragged its feet on this decision? Can we get into that just a little bit more? What's the explanation that we've had so far? The explanation is that uh, repeatedly they've said that, you know, this crypto industry, this crypto market, it's open to fraud, to manipulation. Of course, the irony there is that it was the SEC Twitter <coughs> account that was hacked. Uh, a few people have made that uh, comparison, to put it lightly. But the fact that they allowed the Bitcoin futures ETFs to launch in October 2021 sort of took the legs out of their argument. And that was the basis of Grayscale suing the SEC. Remember, they had applied to convert their Bitcoin trust into a spot Bitcoin ETF. They were denied. They sued the SEC. They won that lawsuit over the summer. And that was really one of the important events that put what we're talking about today in motion. There's an assumption that we are just going to get the nod at some point. We didn't get it yesterday. We thought we were. But at some point in the future, maybe in the next 24 hours, we might. What changes if we do? I've seen the security Bitcoin run up in anticipation of this. But what actually changes? Are the people sitting on desks that couldn't buy it before that now can because it's a spot Bitcoin ETF? That's, that's the big debate going on right now, whether this will turn into a sell the news event. To go back to the Bitcoin futures ETF launch, uh, which I keep harping on, that was the ultimate sell the news event. Bitcoin rallied up to $69,000 a coin in <clears throat> anticipation of that. After the launch, we haven't been anywhere close to that. The magnificent run that you've seen in Bitcoin in anticipation okay. of this, a lot of the critics are saying this is going to be the exact same moment. The advocates are saying that this will turn on the wealth channels being able able to invest in this. In 1934, in the depths of the Depression and then two or three depressions we had within the Depression, the government decided to set up the SEC so we could buy Anaconda Copper, or Boeing didn't even exist. It was, I think, Douglas Aircraft. 
and there'd be accounting and we'd know what was going on. Is there going to be any improvement in the accounting or the we know what's going on with Bitcoin? Is there any change here in the process of how we observe the underlying within the ETF? Well, one of the things that did change, if you think about the applications that have been, been filed since 2013 and this current round of applicants, is that there are surveillance sharing agreements between the underlying exchange, so Coinbase and the SEC. So the SEC theoretically will have more insight here. What really started all of this current enthusiasm is BlackRock filing in June for a spot Bitcoin ETF, which took many, many okay, people by surprise, and they had that feature in there. Let's say a lot of money comes in, and Eric Belchunas says there's some estimates that are maybe overdoing it, but let's say we get a little bit or a level of overdoing it. Does that mean the electric grid in Texas changes because somebody's there going, hey, we got to manufacture more of this, and who cares about the thermodynamics of Bitcoin? We got to make more product. Is that part of this? I wouldn't go that far uh, in terms of whether this means more supply, if uh, I understand you correctly. I will well, no say- No one does, but they can, they can go of it, Katie. <laughs> if you did want to get concerned about the record keeping here, the accounting keeping here, uh, the absolute- Okay, but is it improved? Thank you, you said it better it than the me. Theoretically- is the, is the record keeping of the underlying going to be improved with these ETFs? Theoretically, it would be improved because you have those surveillance sharing agreements. I will say uh, the worry that I've heard from some people, some of the critics, is that what if you lose your wallet address? What if one of these big issuers loses their digital wallet address? You have their, that guy's in the layoffs you can't at find <laughs> your Bitcoin. Who is liable there? Is it the issuer? Is it the market maker? Who would actually be on the hook for that? Those are some of the behind the scenes worries that I've heard about. It's just amazing. Katie, thank you. Katie Graff up there of Bloomberg. TK, there's so much to deal with on this issue still. One quick thing. Is Tom Brady going to come back in and re-endorse an ETF? I would call him even? up now if I could. I think his fingers have been burnt on that, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, but he could this raises he an issue. the money back. And, you know, what since you brought Katie do? back into the conversation, we might as well continue the conversation. There's a feeling, I think, there's a snobbery on, on Wall Street in certain places that the adults are coming into the room now. It's going to change things. That all the fraud you've seen over the last couple of years, the things like... SBF, Sam Bankman Freed, all of those stories that it's going to be BlackRock now. It's going to be the big players on Wall Street. Does that really change things here? I will say there is a certain irony here that you think about the original promise of cryptocurrency, uh, you know, sort of getting away from the government, going bankless, et cetera. It now feels like all of the hopes and dreams have been boiled down to are we going to get a physically backed spot Bitcoin ETF? From uh, a large financial institution on exactly, Wall Street. Exactly, exactly. Which is a real shift, Tom. Just culturally, just, from just, what it was. John, get the surveillance cork out and put it in my mouth. <laughs> I, you know, you know how I feel about this. Got a box of them? Didn't we have I'm a watching, box of them? Yeah, we have a box We've here got a somewhere. Got box of corks under the desk. It, somewhere. It, I, I, I will say this: I'm watching what Gary Gensler does. He's a gentleman of integrity. He's made clear how he feels. It was just a bit embarrassing no. yesterday. This afternoon, no. is it going to happen one way or the other? The idea, the current thinking around the timeline is that these ETFs go effective after the market closed today. That could be between 4 and 6 p.m. Okay. If that happens, we could see trading start tomorrow. So look to the SEC website. Yes. That, that's the guide. We're back All there. Right. Katie, thank you. Katie Graff out there on the latest. Coming up on this program, Michael Purvis of Tallback and Capital Advisors around a table with Tom and myself to break down what's happening in this market. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Totally unchanged this morning, TK. I keep saying that the week begins this <coughs> afternoon and in many ways it does with the New York Fed President John Williams speaking from the Federal Reserve I, then on to the data tomorrow morning. I'll go with that. I'll go with the John Williams speech could have some real uh, oomph to it into the important CPI report but I, I, I'm going to say within all the back and forth and Slock again talking about the massive standard deviation in forecasting I got a VIX of 12.86 which tells me I don't care what the movement is this is a bid under the market period. Things, things are okay still yeah. but there's been a bid under the market for the last how many months now since the end of October yeah, through October, November through yeah. December pretty solid. Seem a sharp point in the other way though, Tom, saying that maybe the first yes. half is a first half of volatility. Yeah, and then the second half is a rally. I just remember that sounds so similar to what I heard at the end of 2022, mm -hmm. looking out to 2023. And the, the basic outlook was dip and then we would rip. And what would, did yeah. we do? January of last year, <clears throat> just totally ripped and tech never really looked back at times. Mm -hmm. Equity futures on the S&P totally unchanged. Michael Purvis coming up next from New York. Good morning.
policy landscape is becoming a lot more clear. If inflation is moderating, I think it's important for the Fed to adjust their policy stance. We really do have to pay attention to these inflationary threats. Inflation often comes in waves. Let's admit we probably have finished the first wave of that inflation. We think that ultimately we go back to a low growth, low inflation, low rate environment. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television worldwide into a deluge of data, the economics of inflation, the earnings, and the maybe they'll hide the profits of the big banks and all, starting on Friday. And then, John, the elite meet degree with you in Davos starting next Tuesday, and there'll be a lot of discussions wrapped around now what? The U.S. economy, where to start, Tom? Let's start with the conflicting data, and I think it's been a story now for a while. You can pick up on the soft data, ISM manufacturing, negative for the last 12-plus months, going all the way back to October 2022, I think. ISM services, pretty awful, last week. And then, TK, things like jobless claims, headline payrolls, all looking decent, and confidence numbers starting to pick right. up. Small business, consumer, all of this conflicting stuff, Tom, and you've got to make a call. And that's what makes 2024 quite difficult, in my opinion. The forecast is there. We have a spectacular guest coming up with a few years of experience. Michael Purvis at Tall Bank and Capital really focused on nominal GDP, John, and the good things of Goldilocks uh, that's out there. Are we going to get Goldilocks from James Dimon? I think he's going to underplay it. My, my guess is... I'm guessing it's really not all that bad. It's at the been great construction for the construction site on Park Avenue. It's been great for the stock of JP Morgan relative uh, to everybody else. Bank of America has been a struggle, but this whole universe in banking turned around after late October. <clears throat> you saw that peak in a two year, a 10 year bond market turns, the whole banking sector did. So, Tom, we can talk about that later in the week. How dependent are these bank stocks on what happens in this treasury market <clears throat> through the year ahead? Yellen speaking up at Boston, Roxbury Community College. There'll be some headlines out. They got to get lower cost to consumers in that. You know what nobody's talking about at the Yellen speech? QT, which directly goes into the banking dynamic, John, away from JP Morgan and Bank of America, all the other banks, commercial real estate, and the challenges of the loan dynamic and the wall of cash. This is about policy sequencing. What comes first? Rate cuts or the end of QT? I think we've had a suggestion in the past week that it's the end of QT, then rate cuts. Yeah. You want to start that dynamic, Tom, in motion. Maybe that begins in the next couple of months just to start flagging that you're going to wind down one before delivering the other. They like a clean sequence over at the Federal Reserve. They do, do you yes. remember when they started hiking yeah. and they knew they were late? but they still wanted to announce that they were winding down QE yeah. before they actually started hiking interest rates. They always seem to like that clean sequence on the FOMC. In the date calendar here before the data check, John, as we get to the idea of maybe we get a Bitcoin soiree. Thank you, Catherine Greifeld, for joining uh, moments ago. We get that done, maybe. 3 p.m., John Williams really begins the economic debate. Frankly, his speech is probably more illuminating than the politics from the Secretary of Treasury. You remember the back to back from Chairman Powell, then on to the New York Fed President, John Williams. Chairman Powell in the news conference, maybe now is the time that we start talking about interest rate cuts. Maybe now is the time. Perhaps now is the time. And then we heard from John Williams, who basically turned around and said, Yeah, we're not right. talking about that right now. I wonder what we get from John Williams later this afternoon. Real rate differential. I'm going to start with this, John Seema Shaw on from Principal, and she said, said real rate stays where it is pretty much plus or minus a little bit and you push that against the shock of what we heard from Priya Mishra of JP Morgan who sees a substantial decrease in the inflation adjusted 10 year yield. Let's get to the scores. We heard from Priya Mishra last week that the 10 year at 4% <clears throat> is a buy. And the 10-year at 4% is basically where we've stayed over the last several days. 399.62, yield to lower by, let's call it, two basis points. In the FX market, things have been snoozy. TK says, look out for Lagarde. <coughs> Next week, the ECB president will speak a few times in Davos, Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum. The euro is stronger at 109.44. The data is anything but strong in Europe at the moment. In the equity market, Tom, totally unchanged, but plenty of catalysts for change through the week ahead. He is far too cut and chiseled to be one of the old guard. Michael Purvis is with Tallback and Capital Advisors, but goes back a few years to a small shop called S.G. Warburg. And I put him in a group with Ed Hyman of Evercore ISI out with their outlook this morning, and also Dr. Yardeni of Yale and Yardeni's optimism on the market. They have been here before. Michael Purvis, thank you so much for joining Surveillance. I'm going to cut to the chase, which is what's your advice 
to the kids buffeted by all of social media and finance, buffeted by shows like this, where you're just saying, look, it's attractive out there, get on board. Yeah, look, I think we just came out of a fantastic and kind of shocking rally up the S&P 500 up 20, uh, 24% last year. Um, we are going to have some indigestion from that. One, one of the statistics I think is interesting is that 14% of that 24% last year came from November and December. We have never had a contribution to overall return as high as that. That's 57% of the market return last year. So when you're looking at this sort of fidgety price action right now we're dealing with, which is not typical of early, mm -hmm. mid-January, expect, you know, that you have to put that in the context of like nine unbroken green right. weeks in a row, right? With all that being said, um, I think we have what I call a dual Goldilocks condition. We had this dovish pivot from the Fed. Now, it's not a perfect pivot. We're going to get walked back, as you were just referencing a bit there. But we've stopped talking about rate hikes after the most violent hiking cycle, arguably, ever. Um, and we're now talking about, you know, um, how many cuts and when, right? That's a big, big difference. That puts the condition of sort of what I call Wall Street Goldilocks, right, the, um, there. But at the same time, we have uh, what I call Main Street Goldilocks, right? We have a, uh, a worker consumer who's in really pretty good shape. Is it perfect? No. But right. um, yeah, we'll find out more tomorrow morning about food right. prices and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. but, but to have the, it's the duality and the, and the concurrence of those two Goldilocks conditions, it's very rare for the market. You go right to where I am. I think of Michael Dardajan at Roth MKM as well. You do a nominal GDP analysis. How will that affect down to earnings season to begin with at the top of the income statement and revenue growth? Do we underestimate? What revenue growth could be? Well, I, it, that comes down to you know your <clears throat> GDP call. I think Bloomberg consensus around 2.2 or so for the year right now, and then inflation. Right now, I think inflation is going to keep coming, trending lower there. But I do. I'm also in that last mile is kind of a long, twisted, and opaque last mile there. I for a whole a whole bunch of reasons there. But can you paint a picture of four and a half five percent nominal GDP this year? Uh, balance between inflation and growth with a much healthier balance than we've had in the last couple of years, absolutely. And I think uh, the, the thing you have to keep in mind, and this gets back into the rotation discussion, is that the, um, it is a downshift from the year of 2023 and a downshift from the year before that, right? And so you are, the cyclical and more economically sensitive companies are fighting a tide there. So yes, I'm very constructive on risk appetite, but as you look into that downshift, um, they're going to have to play, do very well at the margin level, and they're going to have to be able to sort of navigate this lower inflation, sort of compressing their top line. Now let's build on that. We've talked so much about the concentration of the S&P 500 across the MAG7, yeah. but as you've indicated, that's where the earnings growth yeah. has been. NVIDIA, Meta, it's been pretty phenomenal at a few of those companies. That's one of the, what's one of the things we have to um, step back and think about is that, yeah, there was massive PE inflation in the big tech sector in the first half of the year, but the, those companies, those magnificent seven, grew into that earnings growth. In fact, the, the, if you look at the, the, the bag seven rally last year, half of that was PE expansion, half of that was earnings on the year. The, the PE expansion was really in the cyclical sector. The S&P equal weight, that rally was about 12%. On the year, that was almost entirely PE expansion there, right? And earnings just didn't really perform in the cyclicals last year. They held together, but they didn't accelerate. So you're asking the market to go rah rah cyclicals right now when they haven't demonstrated earnings acceleration and we're facing a lower nominal GDP picture in 2024 than we were before. So I don't think it's a matter of, I don't think it's, a, I wouldn't be short cyclicals, right. certainly tactically right now. But I think the Magnificent Seven, bottoms up consensus for Bloomberg is 20% year over year earnings growth. Um, that's pretty impressive. Give that a haircut. Uh, John, one other statistic. Think about the price earnings to growth ratios. For the Magnificent Seven, right now it's 1.4. For the S&P equal weight, it's 1.8. That's, you know, you have both, both factors. So other people might say it's a high bar and we're set up for disappointment for the year ahead. But I think it begs the ultimate question, which is this one. Do I want the equal weight? or do I want the market cap weighted S&P 500? A lot of people are going to boil their investment decision in 2024 down to that one simple question, which right. is very difficult to answer. Do I really want to strip out the muscle of big tech and equal weight the whole thing? 
Look, I mean, their earnings growth, you follow the earnings growth. The earnings growth has been fantastic. Will it be not as good this year as last year? Sure, of course, right? But uh, on a probability adjusted basis, you're taking less economic risk. You're a lot of these companies have the ability to generate synthetic earnings growth through share buybacks in a way that cyclicals can't there. And so I, I think you just have to look at that. Look, if, if cyclicals were dirt cheap, that's a different story, but they're not dirt cheap right now. Massive purpose jargon alert there, folks. It was like CFA level four. What in God's name is synthetic earnings growth? Oh, just share, share buybacks, right? Using your cash, you know, if Apple uses So that's cash. not going to end. Or they're going to bring out more why? debt now. If yields come down, they're going to issue more debt and buy more shares. If back. you were is the CFO of Apple, right. why wouldn't you be doing that, right? Cash okay. machine. Yeah. Well, right. What's your response to your clients when you talk like this? You sound like an old fossil who would never buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You sound like me. <laughs> I'm a pretty old fossil who, is, who, who has never bought Bitcoin. What do your I likely never say? will. Look, on, on Bitcoin? Yeah. Oh, no, not on, well, uh, okay, on Bitcoin. Let's go there. Okay, no, no, on, on Bitcoin, no. I just say, like, you know, you, if you want an alt currency, just gold's been traded as an alt currency for 5,000 years, and that kind of does what it is. And gold right now, I think, is a little bit, you know, it looks, it's a juicy chart, triple top and all that, but you're facing this slow walk back of rate cuts from six to what I think is going to be more like two, the Fed's three, and per their dots, and I think that's going to be that gold breakout is a little bit waiting for Godot right now. You've got to watch it. I'm guessing from your perspective, just the authorization of a spot Bitcoin ETF doesn't change much for you. No, it does not. Um, I think it probably raises the discussion in some institutional invest, investment committee meetings, I guess, but I don't think for long because, look, at the end of the day, what's, it's proven to be a, a sort of a levered play on the NASDAQ during uh, when it was supposed to be. But don't you get the doing, feeling, just to jump in, that there is a little bit of a difference between what they say on those investment committees about what they should do for their clients and what they're doing personally? Because when I speak to a lot of people in the financial industry, they've been dabbling in Bitcoin for years yeah. now, for years and years. Yeah. Are we going to close that gap between what people are doing for themselves and what they're going to start doing for clients? Well, I, I think I think some some institutions will sort of get their arms around Bitcoin a second time. It certainly looks a little bit more legitimate here, but I think you, I always, I always stumble, and I think a lot of institutional <clears throat> investors do too, with the use case. What is it really sort of doing for your portfolio? That's what William right. Cohen said in the FT over the weekend. Bill Cohen was blistering. Blister. I get that complaint a lot, yeah. that they don't have any risk tolerance for something. They don't know why it's up one day and down the next. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, if you have to go to committee and say, like, this is going to be a diversifying asset. Well, it wasn't a diversifying asset, right? I mean, like, you can only so look at the REITs. price history during, during... So were REITs in 1978. Yeah, right. You know, exactly. I believe it was 78. Yeah. Michael, this was great. It's yeah. good yeah. to see you. Michael Purvis there, Jeff Tool back and breaking things down for <clears> us. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 totally unchanged here. We're positive by by 0.03%. Yields are lower by a couple of basis points, 3.99 on the 10-year in the FX market. The dollar just a touch weaker against the euro, 109.47. It's really marginal stuff. We're positive here by 0.15%. Yeah. Coming up at 8.30 Eastern time, we're light on data until we get CPI tomorrow morning, but we will catch up with Kathy Bosjancic of a Nationwide, looking ahead to the face big this afternoon when we hear from Federal Reserve official John Williams of the New York Federal Reserve, Tom, and then the CPI data tomorrow and some PPI to close out the week. And Kathy's going to tell us about the American consumer. I think it's something we've avoided in the show today. And, and it's still 70% of the economy. And, you know, Michael Purvis mentioned it uh, as well. There's a mystery out there about what, what are we going to do with auto sales? Are auto sales going to be 13 million, 15 million, or worse? What's used car inflation going to be? Is, you know, a big part of grocery stores versus restaurants, that kind of dynamic. That's where she's excellent. A food's the one for the mood of the consumer, Tom over the last three years. Yeah. The cumulative inflation you've seen in food. Oh, yeah. And the fact of the matter is the grocery bills just aren't going to return to pre-2020 prices. Are, are you doing what we're doing? In some we're places we're splitting food. I mean, we're ordering, you know, takeout, and, and we're like, we don't need three of this. We need one of those, and we'll split it. That's how we're... Oh, that's what you're doing. You you're know, rationing. Rationing. Yeah. Okay. We're starving I don't, I don't believe that. From New York yeah. City, yeah. good morning. The 2024 nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
we're going to go back and we're going to look at what we could have done better uh, to include, you know, within, within my own organization on the public affairs side and making sure that we are acknowledging and asking those hard questions about ensuring that the public has a timely, not only the public, public Congress and the news media have a timely and accurate understanding of the secretary's status. We certainly didn't have that over the last week. We have some of it now. That was Major General Pat Ryder, Pentagon spokesperson, addressing Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's sudden disappearance and hospitalization, now learning that it was due to complications from surgery for prostate cancer. More on that down in Washington in just a second. Let's just turn to the scores, the price action briefly. Just to give you a feel of things, if you are just tuning in, welcome. Equities totally unchanged on the S&P 500, Tom. We're going nowhere in the equity market. Yields are a little bit lower. We're down to 398.86 on a the center point tendency on Bitcoin at 45,000, maybe we'll hear on that, but I agree with you, John. John Williams this afternoon, the president of the New York Fed, maybe that gets us started with a few choice headlines into inflation and our guesstimate of where we're heading on rates tomorrow. So 3 p.m. this afternoon, into the close. 3 Remain, p.m. for Ryan John Williams. Bostick will have team coverage. 3 p.m. for John Williams, 8.30 a.m. tomorrow morning for CPI. They're your next stops. They're, they're, they're the next stops. But, you know, as you say, it's quiet out there. The one thing I've gone through, we haven't talked about this yet today, is Swiss Frank just hasn't broken through to new, stronger Swiss Frank. Jane Foley, I thought, was brilliant yesterday from Rabobank. And uh, no one's talking about this. I know. And just as one indicator, and it's a euro indicator, I get that. And there's like crazy stuff like Hungarian mortgages with Zurich and all that. Forget about that. It's just a general litmus test of where we're going and we haven't broken through. Maybe we'll break through as you slide through Zurich at the Grand Hyatt Hotel. I keep Hotel. going back to this, Tom. You and I talked about this. Euro Swiss, when they ripped away that 120 floor that was established in yeah. late 2011, September 2011, I believe, when they ripped that away in early 2015, you saw this aggressive move in the Swiss seat. Strong, 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 strong. We're below those levels on that currency pair, Tom. That is real Swiss <clears> strength <throat> that this central bank was fighting against Right. materially for years upon years. And now, well, TK, here it is. Let's take 30 seconds on this. It's important. You and Lisa are going to go to Davos with Anne-Marie Horton, and it's going to be America, America, America. I would suggest right now the broader debate in Happy Valley is whether Europe, particularly with the Germanic decline that we've seen, you wonder if it's going to be Davos Europe this year versus the usual, you know, Asian and China and all that. So, look, Tom, there's a lot of themes to get into, but you've mentioned Europe, so let's talk about it. So it's the breakdown of the German model of the last 10, 20 years. You get security from the United States, you get energy from Russia, and you would build this economic relationship with China. So much of that stuff, Tom, has been threatened or broken down completely. The United States' role in international security now, Tom, is under question again, <clears throat> right. given who might be in the White House at the end of the year. So I would suggest there are a certain group, we can call them the establishment, some people might call them the liberal elite, the gather in Davos at the World Economic Forum every single year, Tom. I think there's going to be some real anxiety in Europe about what comes right. next out of the United States yeah. at the end of this year. Terrific coverage on that. You'll see that next week in Davos, Switzerland. Right now, and to digress into this, there is something different in America about one hospital. It is Walter Reed Hospital, a hospital of joy and sadness. I think of the spirit of Ronald and Nancy Reagan in 1985. He had cancer at the time and had to manage the message forward. The message this week has been a jumble. To give us perspective on old Walter Reed, the Bethesda Walter Reed of now is Michael Shepard of Bloomberg News in Washington. What are people talking about? What the, all the news and the cacophony that John Farrow and I hear, Michael Shepard, what is a distinctive point or study this Wednesday morning? Well, what people are still talking about is what happened to Lloyd Austin and why did it take so long for the Defense Department and the Defense Secretary to be more forthcoming about what had befallen him. Uh, we only learned yesterday that he had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and had undergone surgery for it two days before Christmas. President Joe Biden only learned of that diagnosis yesterday. All of this began emerging on Friday, late in the afternoon, when we typically see agencies putting out bad news. Uh, and the news from the Pentagon at the moment raised more questions than it answered about how long he had been in the hospital, what was, was the right. exact nature of his condition. Is it unprecedented? 
I, you know, I think that for the Defense Department, this is highly unusual. Uh, Lloyd Austin is a private person. Uh, he is known for uh, keeping his, uh, his public image and himself very guarded. At the same time, in his role as the top civilian leading the world's biggest military, he has a different duty of care to the public and, of course, to the chain of command in terms of being forthcoming about this. And that is something that has troubled White House officials and members of Congress. We have seen Republicans on Capitol Hill calling for Austin to resign over this. Uh, we haven't seen Democrats go so far. We don't think that Joe Biden would uh, accept his resignation. Right. But I, we have Mike, I don't want to interrupt, but John Furrier, this is driving me nuts because Shepard's given us the Washington line. The guy has prostate cancer. The debate changed yesterday. You think it there did? was a discussion here, which Michael's leading on beautifully. But I would I would suggest the debate radically changed with the announcement of prostate cancer yesterday. Well, I think it's highly sensitive given the nature of the disease and the medical yeah. issue, Tom. Right. But when it comes to pure protocols, which is Michael is talking about, I think not much has changed, Tom. We're talking about a very very delicate time for the United States Absolutely. and international security. Right. And Michael, given the news we've heard this morning that Houthi rebels have launched one of the most complex attacks in the Red Sea to date. Begs the question, Michael, who's running the government? Who's running this? Well, through this whole situation, the, the White House and the Defense Department have insisted that there is no change to U.S. readiness because of Lloyd, As Lloyd Austin's absence from, uh, from the Defense Department. They insist that he has been able to carry out the duties he has needed to, even while he has been interned more recently at Walter Reed. He is still there, by the way, but he has been taking calls. Uh, of course, it is hard for him to travel and to do other uh, parts of his job. He has delegated some of that uh, in the past week to his number two, Kathleen Hicks. But again, it does raise questions about uh, who is in charge. Typically, the president goes through his national security advisor in dealing with Austin and the rest of the national security uh, uh, establishment. So it's not unusual for Biden not to be speaking with Austin every day. But if he were to be absent, you would think that uh, the defense chief would at least alert the president, hey, I'm going to be out for a few days, here is why, and here is who will be taking over. And the White House has insisted now on having that kind of notification, not only from DOD, but as well from the rest of his cabinet secretaries as well. Michael, let's finish on this. Later on this evening, plenty of programming. Take your pick. CNN, you can watch Ron DeSantis versus Nikki Haley. At the same time on Fox News, you can watch maybe the former president, Donald Trump. Michael, what are you focused on later on today? Well, for me, it'll be a split screen moment. Honestly, we have to, you know, watch all the candidates very carefully. For uh, DeSantis and uh, Nikki Haley, tonight is a uh, is a moment, their last chance to to take each other on head to head and make that argument to voters that they are a better alternative to Donald Trump, who right now is leading in Iowa by 30 points or more, depending on the polls that you're looking at. Michael Shepard. Michael, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Mike. The update down in Washington. Split screen this afternoon, TK, this evening. That's the way they roll in, in Washington. York. You know, you and I, we're not capable of doing that. But, you know, AMH sometimes has three. Well, she's got the boxes. And the and smartphone up or the tablet. You, know, you watch she's, one she's and then you have, you know, yeah. the TV up yeah. for the we other. Six different networks and see what everybody's Got a few doing. more months of this, haven't we? Well, a you few know? more months. It's barely <laughs> started. I mean, it's starting here on Monday with the Iowa caucus. And... Uh, you know, the New Hampshire primary and, and onward and forward. I will say percolating here within the finance that we do is always the importance of Super Tuesday. I think it's still super. March 5th. I uh, do the likes of Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis make it that far? Is someone out by Yeah, him? I think the focus there within the split screen of our good Mike Shepard is on DeSantis. It'll yes. Be, and Chris Christie as well. I, I would say so. Uh, Chris well. Christie at the moment, Tom, not even <clears throat> a, a thought. Yeah. Not even a second. Yeah spent thinking about him this morning with regards to this race. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up, Kathy Bosjancic of Nationwide on CPI data, about 24 hours and four minutes away. Sixty minutes and about 22 seconds away from the opening bell. Here are the scores on the S&P 500 and beyond. On the Nasdaq, on the Russell, we look like this. On the S&P, positive Completely by 0.04%. 0 
We'll go right the way through all the boards, Tom, on the NASDAQ, up by 0.07% on the NASDAQ 100. Let's turn to the bond market. Let's get to the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, the 10-year, down two or three basis points, 398.48, 398.67. Not even 4% this morning, but just <coughs> in and around that level, Tom, over the last few sessions on a two-year, 433.29. I think the biggest move that you've had on a two-year in the last three or four sessions is the one you've got on the screen right now. Yesterday on the two-year, we were down about a basis point. On Monday, not even, and on Friday, unchanged even after payrolls in the ISM we got we just went absolutely nowhere yeah I, I would really watch the yield space and I also watch what the magnificent seven are before yesterday there was a 75 percent recovery sort of on a blended basis from the gloom of what January two three four I don't know how long it lasted and then we furthered that yesterday with a VIX 12.88 and you know it's sort of a point in our return we're focused on JP Morgan and Bank of America because they're within three zip codes and it's what we do with the Bloomberg terminal but I'm sorry, January 24th, which I believe is a Wednesday, there's a small company, Satya Nadella runs it. They yeah. got a nodding acquaintance <laughs> with a cloud. Maybe Microsoft is more important this time around than JP Morgan. Hasn't he been like the CEO of the last 10 years? Nadella is so impressive, Tom. And the what PR thing company? with the uproar, remember OpenAI where you and I had no yes, clue what was that. going Forget on? That. And, he really handled that pretty Just well. Transforming this company from what it was. <clears throat> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. From Gates to Barmer to him. It's yeah. just amazing. I'm reading his bio right now. I, I, I suggest it, folks. There's no other way to put it. Do you want to bring him a key or do you want to? I was going to just round things out. I promised you foreign exchange. Okay, please. Yeah, Let's yeah, get to that. Let's get the to euro yeah. looks like this against Euro's the dollar. Unched. 109.45, basically unched. Almost unchanged. Positive 0.13%. Not much data this morning. That picks up tomorrow morning with CPI 24 hours away. And then you've got PPI after that. You've got a ton of Fed speak. Just starts to pick up. Just starts to pick up a little bit. John Williams, the current New York Fed president, later on this afternoon around 3 p.m. Tomorrow, 11.30, Michael McKee, Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Please. Fed. Mike McKee joins us now. He's, I think yeah. he's got the Bitcoin thing up. I think he's got speaking his, to the mic, TK. No, but he's putting I'm looking at his <laughs> screen it, over here. Got, uh, it, McKee's putting in his first order it, of the Bitcoin it, ETF is what he's it's doing. It's a chart on uh, <clears throat> uncertainty, but <laughs> it's it, not, it does it's not look a little bit like uh, <laughs> perhaps the, the Bitcoin uh, exchange at about 4 15 p.m. yesterday. Run afternoon. us through the uh, Mester <laughs> interview you're looking for tomorrow. Well, essentially, you want to see how much confidence one of the bigger hawks has that we are out of the woods on inflation because uh, we saw uh, Mickey Bowman yesterday say that essentially she thinks we are at peak and she's the one who's been urging uh, the Fed to continue raising rates. So if that's the case, then uh, we will. Uh, see if uh, Loretta agrees and, and that might give a little more certainty to it. Um, one of the questions that's arisen is what they should do about the balance sheet. It's not uh, the Open Market Committee's actual decision. It's uh, the board, uh, but because uh, the board's in charge of that, but uh, they will weigh in on it. So we'll see mm -hmm. what it looks like from there. And what I got, I got uh, somebody sent me a question the other day, which I think is very important, uh, and that is, uh, what do you think is driving inflation now? Do we think it's going to keep coming down? How confident are you that it will come down? And, right. and uh, uh, you know, what's the inflation dynamic these days? In the last 24 hours on LinkedIn, somebody had put out Howard Marks' annual letter and Ken Rogoff with a blistering op-ed in Project Syndicate, both suggesting we're set up for a higher rate regime. I think that gives more importance from Howard Marks and Professor Rogoff of Harvard of what we're going to hear from John Williams this afternoon. Is John Williams going to do a rote speech or is he going to address again his r star call that we get back to a lower rate regime? Uh, probably, I don't, I don't want to call it a rote speech, but it's an economic outlook. So I don't think he's going to be talking long term. I think he's going to be talking shorter term. And there's no question at the Fed, even with John Williams, that you're going to have a higher rate regime than we did. We're not going back to zero. The issue is where do we go down to? And that brings in the R star issue for John Williams. But I don't think he's going to go there yet because we're still a long way from rate cuts, let alone getting down to a uh, so-called neutral level, whatever that is. You raised a really important question, which is what is driving inflation currently? And I think we also have to ask another. How much of the hiking that we've seen over the last 18 months 
has contributed to the disinflation we've seen over the last several months. Can we put our finger on that with ease? We can't, and people are trying to do that. Uh, and it's hard to parse it out because a lot of it is the supply chains. And most economists are coming around to that argument that it's been supply chains normalizing that have brought down inflation. And then things like uh, oil prices coming down because demand has fallen off now. Is it demand in the United States caused by the Fed or is it demand in China uh, because their economy <coughs> is uh, very weak right now? Those are hard things to parse out and so um, the, the Fed is going to take credit and they need the credit for their credibility. So yeah. let them take it. Uh, it's like the old thing about, you know, doesn't matter as long as you, who gets the credit as long as you have a success. So they got a lot of the blame as well. They got a lot fairness. of the blame. It's like being the president of the United States. True. You have very little to do with the economy, these day-to-day -day movements, but you get all the blame and very occasionally the credit. Well, at least you try and take it. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Look out for Mike McKee's interview with Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed tomorrow morning, 11.30 <coughs> Eastern time. Later on today, the Fed speak picking up with John Williams TK of the New York Fed at 3.15. And before that, Michael McKee with his Bitcoin ETF order, if they ever get the damn thing open, we will have to see. Right now to further the discussion, on the American economy, Kathleen Bostjansik joins us, Chief Economist, Nationwide Mutual Insurance. Kathy, what's the state of the consumer? Uh, good morning, Tom and John. Happy to be with you. Um, well, the consumer's been really resilient and not really reflective of uh, the labor market continued to be quite strong. Um, we've got employment growth that continues to kind of outpace you know, the monthly estimates and wage growth continues to be buoyant. Um, so, you know, put that together, you still have, you know, income wherewithal for the consumer uh, to keep spending. Now, it's not going to be the buoyant spending that we had in the past. You know, most much of the, if not all of the pandemic related savings has been run down. But, you know, until we see a slowdown in the labor market, the consumer can continue to run here. The character of our wage growth as compared to a declining inflation is something the optimists speak of. Is it normal? Is it a normal dynamic now? Or do you put an asterisk around what that means? It's getting more normalized. I mean, wage growth, if you look at the average hourly earnings numbers running 4-1, you, know, you would probably in a more normal time see that around 3.5. Um, so you're seeing wage growth still a bit you know, buoyant there. But inflation is not back to 2% yet either. So I think in the mix, what you're seeing is, is real wage growth um, that is, is steady. You know, it's not stellar, um, but, but it's not negative either. So, you know, that, that helps to, you know, kind of keep the consumer buoyant. Um, but we, we do think there's some slowing underneath the headline em employment numbers. And I, I do think we are going to see. The question is, do we see... Um, you know, just a soft patch in growth in the middle part of the year, or do we get a mild recession? We're, we're still thinking that mild recession is possible, uh, but, but you know, certainly recognize that the data have come in stronger than expected, and that, and that could continue. Kathy, how would you expect John Williams, the New York Fed president, to address some of those issues this afternoon? Yeah, it, it, very much looking forward to his comments. Um, you know, and to put into perspective, like they kind of were talking about rate cuts. Well, not really, but, you know, and the minutes helped us out a little bit there. But I, I do think they're, they're at an interesting time now. I mean, in, in a way, it's better than they thought, right? But it's still complicated. It's better because inflation has come down <clears throat> much quicker than they thought. The, the labor market's been more resilient. But the, now the, the, the idea is, well, it's not just about lowering inflation, but can we stabilize the economy to avoid you know, a, a harder landing. So um, I, I'm very interested to see how he kind of threads that. I think one message he'll probably deliver is the bond market is still a little too optimistic in, in the start of the, 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 the timing of rate cuts. But to be honest, we're looking for May, May, June markets sort of pricing in high odds of March. Not all that different. Um, the fact is the Fed's going to be cutting rates this year unless something on inflation starts to turn around in a very ugly way. Well, Kathy, not all rate cuts are created equally. And I think that on the surface, it's almost contradictory to talk about maintaining a restrictive stance and entertain these surgical rate cuts at the same time with a focus on real yields. Do you think they can entertain both ideas simultaneously and communicate effectively and clearly? 
Well, communication has not been their, um, you know, the top uh, bright spot here, really, to be honest. Um, you know, they um, they need to communicate clearly. And But I do also think your point is, is well taken. Are you just removing some of that restrictiveness but still want to hang on to it because you are not quite 100 percent confident inflation is getting back to 2 percent? Or do you say, you know what, inflation, we do have a high degree of confidence. You know, getting to the point with, you know, Mike's interview with Loretta Mester, you know, how confident they are <laughs> we're going back to 2 percent and how does that real rate, right. you know, play into it? To, to the mix of things, because right now the real rate is higher, right, de facto. And Kathy, Columbus, Ohio, Nationwide is on your side and all that. The unemployment rate is 2.80%. Help me with Senator Warren from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Shouldn't we be up on the tables popping champagne and celebrating an unemployment rate of 2.80%? Yes, I mean we we should be celebrating that this economy is 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 quite good, um, and and you know inflation is coming down. You know maybe that is why consumers overall maybe there's not as much exuberance out there. But but inflation is coming down. Eventually, the Fed's going to be cutting interest rates at some point this year. You know that's that's a very positive mix. And to your point, unemployment rate, certain parts of the country like Columbus very, very low and, and, and very positive. So I think we need to applaud a lot of that. And that sort of gets overshadowed by all of our concerns. Hey, Kathy, um, just quickly, where do you have unemployment, your rent? Yeah, so we, we see the unemployment rate um, drifting a bit higher. But it, because we have a mild recession, it doesn't even get above 5%. Um, so you're looking at something around 4.7% uh percent or so at the high so let some of the air out of, of the economy but certainly does not crush the labor market interesting kathy thank you appreciate the insight kathy bonchancet there of nationwide <clears throat> looking tom for an inflation rate to carry on coming in potentially for the economy even if it dips into recession to only see an unemployment rate that goes into the high fours. The Federal Reserve's got unemployment at something right. like 4.1 percent year end this year. Yeah, there's some real interesting dynamics here, and it's way more complex than just the simplicity we toss around. But yeah, I, I just, it's an arch issue here of a fully employed America, and yet you read about the challenges out there. For example, just as one, the number of people getting jobs full time versus part time and the part-timeism of people with two or three jobs. Yep. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500, almost totally unchanged. Just slightly negative in the last five or 10 minutes. We're down by 0.02%. Oh, Yields are lower by two <coughs> basis points, 399.24. In the commodity market, $73.17 on WTI. Even with those difficulties, Tom, in the Red Sea that we've been talking about all morning. Yeah, I, I think this is something we've underplayed. I've been remiss on that. But the Red Sea, I'm going to say it's heated up. When you have 18 things coming at a ship, that's not two things. It's not one thing. You know, this is like a concerted effort. And you you have, just have to wonder when there's going to be a response. I, I mean, I'm, well, I'm Well, there was I'm a response, waiting. wasn't there? I think all of America's waiting. We were talking to well. Mike Shepard about this about 20 minutes ago. We're talking about U.S. forces and allies shooting down 18 drones and a barrage yeah. of missiles. This is real stuff. It's why AP, AP Molomesk, the container shipping giant, has basically paused <coughs> operations through the Red Sea for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and, and you just got to wonder into the weekend here, and we're all distracted with Iowa and the rest. You know what? There's not one, there's two major wars going on uh, that, that we need to focus on. Huge challenges in Ukraine. I know a focus for you at Davos. Big time. There's a lot to discuss. Coming up next on the program, the brilliant <coughs> David Rubenstein of the Carlisle Group. That conversation up next. the new GLP-1 inhibitors, which are these drugs that really affect how we feel about being full, 
become further advanced. I think it's going to be an overall sea change for American healthcare. I think the global impact is one to actually reduce our overall health burden, including cancer. This is a massive story. That was Dr. Samwin Vickers there of Memorial Sloan Kettering, the president and CEO, speaking with the brilliant <coughs> David Rubenstein. You can watch more of the interview tonight on the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations at 9 p.m. in New York. You just get the feeling, Tom, we're only scratching the surface around that story, what these drugs can be used for and how they might transform <coughs> the American economy. You've been on top of this, John. I was like, yeah, okay, you know, just the giggles and all the rest. But the answer is this has become a real, real story, not only for the companies that are leading the way, including Eli Lilly, but it just keeps growing. And my only question is within the research, is somebody tell me there's not a downside to this? And I don't believe I've seen a downside to this yet, which really gets my attention. We've talked a lot about side effects, Tom, but I think there's still research being conducted about what they can be used for if it's just this, if it's diabetes, if it's weight loss, but also, Tom, if it's addiction, <clears throat> if you can deal with addiction as well more broadly, away from obesity and the amount of food that you're consuming, yeah. you wonder what it means for alcoholism, you wonder what it means for right. gambling. There's a whole range of issues here that I just wonder, Tom, whether we are truly only scratching the surface about how effective and how broad-based <clears throat> the use of these drugs might be. In my read of this is, you know, within the family and, you know, everybody tangential to me is it's portion control. And the answer is, what does it do if you have a drug like this to the discipline of Americans way overeating on size and scope. I mean, I see that in my travels to each and every country. I mean, there's something unique about how the Americans chow down the food. Are we going to chow down ever more now that we got a wonder drug? I don't know. Ah, we're going to eat different things. Full disclosure, I'm not on this. John Farrell, change. you've considered it, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, because I... <laughs> OK, let's leave that Let's right Let's there. move on. OK, let's get to the scores <laughs> on the S&P 500. <clears throat> we'll rip through the price action, then I'll get you some top stories. We're unchanged this morning on the S&P. We're going almost absolutely nowhere. We're negative 0.04% on the S&P 500. Yield to lower buy, let's call it two basis points on a 10-year, 3.99. 05 on a 10 year this morning. There's a lot happening in the next 24 hours or so. CPI is coming tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern time. And then it's on to PPI on Friday. Tons of bank earnings as well. JP Morgan, Bank of America and Citigroup just to really get bank earnings season underway. <coughs> My focus, I think yours too, Tom, is on Apple. Apple is going to be reporting yes. on February 2nd. Apple <coughs> was the company coming right. into the new year because of the downgrades we saw from Barclays and Piper Sandler. We're going to go further than that, folks. You're going to see our team coverage of Apple, and we're so advantaged by having Mark Gurman uh, with us in, 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 in all that he does with his newsletter, Power On. But John, it's more than Apple. This is the one time where the Magnificent Seven, and I know they're all different stories, but we really need to hear the nuances of Amazon, the nuances of Microsoft, uh, and the others. And you know, Tesla's its own little story with Elon and all that. But this is the one time you don't want to just sit on Apple for your analysis. Do you want some news on the administration? <clears throat> this from Axios. President Biden's top Middle East advisor, Brett McGurk, met in Doha on Tuesday with the Qatari prime minister and discussed regional tensions and efforts to secure the release of hostages held in Gaza. This according to a U.S. source, Tom, and two other officials, two other sources familiar with the trip. It's interesting <coughs> off the back of that reporting, we also learned in the last 24 hours, great reporting from the likes of Abed and Ardelli and the team, that a secret meeting took place last month between Ukraine, its group yeah. of seven allies and a small group of global South countries to try to rally support for Kyiv's conditions for holding peace talks with Russia, according to people familiar with the matter. So you've got these two wars happening on the surface that we're all seeing from the outside looking in looking at what's happening in Ukraine from the United States, Tom, right. looking at what's happening in Gaza between Hamas and Israel. And then these secret talks just happening on the sidelines that we're learning more and more about yeah. from various publications. In the old days, we called this diplomacy. What's different now is a diplomacy, including the visibility of a headline, a scoop, if you will. And, and what the Biden administration is doing is it's all moving at light speed now. How do you prosecute diplomacy in 2024? versus 1944 or 1964 in Vietnam. It's a completely different story. Well, especially, Tom, as you've pointed out a million times, given <clears throat> the immediacy of the imagery that's being delivered into people's homes. We're witnessing these wars in, in real time, in real time. I, I would like to really know. really graphic, terrible, yeah. horrific ways. My, my focus, I guess, and you know, I'm, I'm from the outside looking in, is our diplomacy with the Israeli government. And you know, I, I look back, folks, at the coverage we've done and our conversation with the former governor of the Bank of Israel, Jacob Frankel, 
it wasn't chilling that overstates it, but he was quite forceful on how domestic Israeli politics is shattered. You know, it was tangible. That's the latest reporting from Axios. Let's go through some of the top <coughs> stories elsewhere. Under Savannah's this morning, Houthi rebels launching one of their most complex attacks in the Red Sea to date. U.S. forces and allies shooting down 18 drones and a barrage of missiles aimed for merchant shipping lanes. U.S. Central Command confirming no injuries or damage was done. Many shipping companies have already rerouted vessels away from the Red Sea, sending ships on a longer route around southern Africa. Tom, just speaking again to the tension in that particular part of the world. Shanghai to New York. We mentioned this last week. I think it's 2,300 miles you add on with Cape of Good Hope. And my reading is it's overwrought. It's not a Patrick O'Brien novel from the Napoleonic Wars. It's overwrought the danger around the Cap Cape of Good Hope. But it's just it's a darn longer trip than going through the Suez Yeah, Canal. much longer and yeah. more expensive potentially yes. as well. The latest on <clears throat> Boeing, this is what we've heard from the CEO, Dave Calhoun, speaking to the public yesterday as concerns grow over, this, over the safety of the 737 MAX 9 jet. All I could think about. I didn't know what happened to whoever was supposed to be in the seat next to that hole in the airplane. I got kids, I got grandkids, and so do you. This stuff matters. U.S. regulators grounding the planes and ordering inspections after a door plug ejected from an Alaska Airlines flight on Friday. Alaska and United have both found additional loose bolts during their own inspections. There's no clear timetable for the jets to be put back in service. We caught up with Jeffries earlier this morning who indicated that maybe we're back in the air by next week. Fact of the matter is, can't move away from this, Tom. Dave Calhoun alluded to it. Thank goodness there was no one in that seat. Well, there's right the, next to that yeah. hole in that plane. Yes, but beyond that, will there be a next time? And the news is not encouraging. To me, the single tip point was when United said, hey, you know what? We looked at some planes and we've got bolt or fastener or rivet problems as is, is well. And that's when it shifted from is this one isolated plane or not? and not reign supreme within our uncertainty this morning. What does it mean for the business? You heard what Jeffrey said earlier. <clears throat> so we had Michael O'Leary sitting in that chair from Ryanair, complaining, Tom, about the delays to deliveries from Boeing. And there is a real chance, a well, possibility, given that we don't know what's going to happen here, that you could see further delays to those deliveries. And the response you get from analysts, including from Jeffries, is that ultimately you're unlikely to see cancellations of orders. That order book, mm -hmm. Tom, not the problem. For a long time, the problem has been deliveries and ramping up production because the order block is absolutely well, packed. The common theme here from experts like Brooke Sutherland and Sheila over at Jeffries is simple. This is about COVID and a diminished labor force quality. And frankly, John, you're hearing that in a lot of other industries as well. I look at team surveillance and there's no question we're diminished off of COVID. Fun of story well. for us. BlackRock cutting jobs, Tom. Let's finish there. Yeah. Cutting 600 jobs or 3% of staff, citing rapid changes in asset <clears throat> management. The CEO, Larry Fink, with some pretty emphatic things to say, writing in a yeah. memo, quote, we see our industry changing faster than at any time since the founding <clears throat> of BlackRock. Executives saying ETFs are becoming the preference for both index and active management strategies. The firm's still expecting to have a larger staff by the end of the year, despite these cuts. But Tom, I think well, you said it, and I said it earlier on in the program, you nailed it. You were looking to financial services and the potential for cuts to start to come through. There's one set of cuts, asset management specifically. Are we going to hear more about that as we close out the week? And it's an opportunity. And, and the answer is at the percentage point, where is it an opportunity? And people expert in this, Sri Natarajan and others, would say two, three, four percent cuts, maybe like this BlackRock one, is an opportunity that you rehire in places where you need people. Maybe it's ETFs and Bitcoin. Uh, but the answer is the moment you get out over a four percent cut, you're talking tangible, and with BlackRock, it's the cuts now and the cuts earlier in the year sum up to a pretty large number. The bank earnings still to come this Friday morning, still to come on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Pack schedule, don't miss this. 1 p.m. Eastern time, Kathy Wood <coughs> of ARK Investment. Wonderful. I imagine there's going to be a question or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight, Tom or 9 or 10 or 11 for that matter, on the Bitcoin spot she, ETF. We spoke to her in London and, you know, we really hand, handed it to her and she was very good about justifying her track record. Are you going to be glued to the Bloomberg terminal later on this afternoon to, to see whether this plays no, out my or people not? Are, my, well, my people are got me in some orders, you know. It's like, you know Is yeah. that interrupting the nap? 
Well, I don't know. I make a decision. Do I put it in a 201K or do I just go, you know, taxable? Stay in cash, dead case. You know, it's served I, you well. It's served I, you well. I'm looking to buy my first share of Apple. From New York City this morning, good morning. Good <clears throat> morning.